the zoning changes would improve the tax base in the city. They would create the opportunity for sustainable development. And um, I can't think of anything new. Um, <laughs> But I really strongly, strongly encourage you to vote on this tonight. We've been waiting a long time. Um, we'd like to free you up to, for other business for the council and for the town. And I really, really ask you to vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hamanth uh, Swaminathan. And I'm, and I'm really sorry if I pronounced your no, name. No, you do a oh. fine job with that. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, good evening. I'm here to talk zoning. Um, and, I, and I'm sorry, you know what, I did add, if everyone could state their name and their address Pardon, for the um, record. So. Swami Nathan, uh, North Maple Street. Um, so I've been to a couple of these. The last one, I walked out and a um, few, few observations. One was, um, as far as observations of the people that opposed the uh, proposed legislation, the zoning laws, um, someone had mentioned bringing an outside consultant. There's already been an outside consultant to do this whole planning thing. It's, it's been done, and it's like, you, you're gonna beat this thing. This thing's been beaten to death. It's ready to go. It's, it's in a good place, and I've, I've actually read it. I don't, I don't know a lot of people have read it that oppose it. And the other observation is people are concerned about kind of two things, condos in their backyard and riffraff moving into the neighborhood. And it just doesn't, there's no sense to that. I understand the fear, but it's a fear thing. And I understand that people have fears. Um, but the way it's written, you know, it doesn't really allow for that, the way um, the proposed zoning law changes. You know, people can't just start doing that. Um, and as far as the riffraff thing, that's just kind of unfortunate. That's because you know, people need a place to live, and I need a place to live. I'd love to build a place in Northampton. If I built a place in Northampton, it'll cost me 200 grand for the lot. It'll cost me half a million dollars to build a modest home in Northampton. And the proposed changes will alleviate some of that. The, it'll bring the co cost a lot down, and um, more people can come in, more people can spend money in Northampton, pay taxes. I think it's a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Bobar. I'm Jeffrey Bobar, 35 Fruit Street. I'm not for speaking for the zoning. We have a beautiful parking garage on Gothic Street. And when I drove in this tonight, they changed the sign. Restricted parking, Monday through Friday, 7 to 5. And after hours and on weekends, it's free. And I would like to sit, have it stay that way. However, I'd like to have the ordinance amendment. If people want to park overnight or on weekends, the city should be able to have a parking pass for, say, 25 or $30 a month. It's a tremendous boon to the first churches, of which I'm a member, of having nearby parking for council and board meetings, choir rehearsals, church services. One thing this city's got to watch out for, not to be so greedy as to drive the business out of the downtown when we are facing, possibly in a few years, casinos in Springfield and West Springfield. It's a beautiful garage for short-term parking. Let's leave it like the old lot was, free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lily, you, you're actually part of a presentation, do you? And I'm speaking on a different matter, Bill. Okay, by all means. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, Lily Lombard, 39 Monroe Street. I'm actually here as um, Executive Director of Growth Food Northampton, which is the nonprofit in town that owns the Northampton Community Farm, leasing to hundreds of organic gardeners, three sustainable farm businesses, and that serves thousands of local consumers, including probably many of you. Uh, the Florence Fields Recreation Area sits at the epicenter of our 121-acre organic garden and farm and is currently under construction. On June 12th, um, Grove Food Northampton emailed a letter to the mayor, the rec department director, and our city planner, and um, CC'd a number of you. And the letter was very collaborative in tone and respectfully asked to know the details of any synthetic amendment applied to the site at least two weeks in advance. 
explaining, quote, the chemical treatment of Florence Field stands to impact directly our farmers with implications for their livelihoods, organic certification, and need to establish costly buffers along the perimeter of the treated areas. Currently, Crimson and Clover Farm, their pick your own fields, where shareholders now are actively picking fruit and vegetables, lies 25 feet from the border with Florence Fields. So I was dismayed to learn this morning of an imminent spraying of Roundup after a grain farmer happened to overhear one of the contractors at Florence Fields shouting some instructions to one of his coworkers. So I hustled down to the field and confirmed with the general contractor that yes, there would be spraying of the entire 24 acre field with Roundup in a week and no, they hadn't been instructed by the city to provide any sort of notice. So absent of this lucky tip off, the spraying would have occurred without any warning to us at all. Um, in a town that prides itself on good governance, we feel that we have what we've requested is eminently reasonable, full transparency, and decent regard for public health and safety through advance notice of the application of chemicals that could put citizens at risk and our farmers at an economic loss. Our farmers, gardeners, and consumers are your constituents. In fact, our grain farmer would have liked to have been here tonight speaking, but he was um, nursing his ailing mother who just had surgery today. And as such, we ask our elected officials and the public at large to support our request for two weeks notice and full disclosure of chemical applications at Florence Fields. We thank the mayor for his attention to our concern today by seeking to obtain the contractor's spraying schedule. And we look forward to bringing uh, along with the city the larger discussion of Florence Fields uh, turf management into the public arena. Ultimately, I believe we all welcome a way to develop and manage the turf at um, these promising new sports fields in a way that does not use toxic substances. Thank you. Thank you. Mac Everett, please. Counselors, like you, I have heard homeowners step up here and urge pack, uh, passing of the zoning package because they want more flexibility in making additions or conversions. Some would like to carve off a house lot for a relative or to sell one off to finance retirement. I regard these as appropriate and modest infill proposals that I can support and urge the council to pass. I have also heard several tenants call for more affordable housing so they might stop renting and buy homes in a community they love. I think smaller lot sizes are a step towards making their dreams possible. At the same time, I'm still troubled by the consequences that might come with the current proposal as regards larger scale multi-unit development that could be shoehorned into densely packed neighborhoods. I'll define that for now as five or more new units of new construction on parcels close to downtown. There are too many ifs right now. If we could guarantee that the new units would be bought by first-time buyers, especially those who would prefer to walk or bicycle downtown instead of driving, well, of course, we can't do that. If we could guarantee that developers would build tasteful, well-constructed units without squeezing, say, 8 to 12 units on a shoebox-shaped lot that has always held a single-family home, then my feelings would be different. If we could guarantee that the state or federal government would return more of our tax dollars to build better sidewalks, more bike lanes, and well-paved streets, well, now I'm dreaming. The proposal to reduce multifamily frontage requirements to a mere 50 feet in URB and URC will open the door to large-scale development. Its consequences will include reducing green space, clogging narrow streets with more traffic, worsening on-street parking, and further taxing an infrastructure we already struggle to maintain. Councilors Adams and Freeman Daniels have been listening and suggesting modifications to the proposal. I truly appreciate their efforts to work with concerned community members. At the Ordinance Committee meeting on Monday, Councilor Freeman Daniels suggested the council consider passing the rest of the proposal while putting a moratorium on projects of seven units or larger to enable the community to take another look at a policy that will have a critical impact on the look and feel of residential Northampton for decades to come. Major, major zoning changes are just too important to rush. Personally, I would urge a nine-month moratorium on new construction of five or more units. 
Meanwhile, let modest infill move forward while giving the community more time to define what kinds of bigger projects will enhance Northampton and preserve its neighborhood's unique, uh, neighborhood's unique characters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Claudia Lefko, please. Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I'm here to ask the City Council to delay voting on the proposed zoning, zoning ordinance. We could put this to a citywide vote as suggested at an earlier meeting, or we could send it back to a reconstituted zoning committee. I feel it's important to reconcile the recommendations from the original zoning committee with those coming from the City Planning Department. The committee achieved a very high standard, reaching consensus on their recommendations, only to see some of them put aside or ignored. Democracy is demanding. In my neighborhood, in my ward, Ward 3, people have put in countless hours on, committee, on committees and in meetings. We have appeared numerous times, as you know, before the city council and various committees. It's nice to have an opportunity for input, but my expectation as a citizen is that my opinion and those of my neighbors will be given due consideration. Time and time again, we are encouraged to get involved. In some instances, citizen in involvement is mandated. We on only to have our suggestions put aside. It's very discouraging. Even in our fair city, there is a sense that there is an agenda and it cannot be altered. The direction cannot be changed. So we zone out. This isn't what we want. I assume all of you, the mayor and I, want the same thing. A population that's actively involved and informed and a government that is representative and responsive to citizens. Councillor Murphy acknowledged the other evening at the Ordinance Committee that there will be unintended consequences if this zoning proposal passes. If councillors are aware of negative unintended consequences, consequences, and many of you have been brought, many of these have been brought to your attention, you should vote no tonight. A yes vote could be seen as what one sociologist calls an imperious immediacy of interest where someone, in this case the city government or the planning department, wants something so much that you are collectively willing to ignore the unintended consequences of your action. The consequences have been clearly brought to your attention many, many times. It isn't fair and it isn't right for you to ignore them and proceed with the zoning change. I urge you tonight to vote no and to make an alternative plan to remedy the negative consequences feared by our neighborhood and others in the city. There is no rush to this. It's been 30 years in coming. We should work together until there's a better plan, one that more accurately reflects the recommendations of the original zoning committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jen Ramsey, please. I don't know how you could spare the time, actually. Hey, Jen Ramsey, <laughs> 380 Elm Street. Uh, you might recognize me as the Media Resources Coordinator at NCTV. Just here to tell everyone about a couple of events that are going on. Um, Cinema Northampton, it's a new initiative we have. It's an outdoor uh, screening for the public of different movies. We're having The Princess Bride tomorrow night. Um, field opens at 7, the show starts at 8.30, and that's at the Northampton High School football field. There's going to be concessions for sale to benefit the um, boosters, so everybody should come on down. It's free and open to the public. Bring your friends and family, bring blankets, and uh, we'll have some bug spray, but you can bring that too. <laughs> um, and also we're doing a youth filmmaking workshop at the end of August, so I wanted to let everybody know about that. If anyone is in interested, it's August 28th, 26th to 30th. 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., open ages 13 to 18, and basically any uh, teen that's interested in filmmaking, screenwriting, acting, um, and, and video production can sign up through our website, northamptontv.org, or they can give us a call at 587-3550. And that's it. Thank you, Jen. Want me to give you, you time to get back? Flyers here if anyone wants to. I'll give you time to get back to the booth. Uh, Scott Flynn, please. My name is Scott Flynn, live at 52 Hadley Street, South Hadley. I'm a Northampton firefighter and president of the Firefighters Local 108. I'm here to speak on behalf of my members and urge you to support the two financial orders that pertain to our collective bargaining agreement. The cost of doing so is significantly less than what the arbitration panel decided was a fair and just settlement. 
The award was the result of a long and costly process that both the city and firefighters agreed to. We agreed knowing full well that we were bound to support the outcome for better or for worse. This outcome was not unreasonable, and in fact, it was not exactly what our negotiating committee had expected or desired. The cost of living increases were higher than what other employees received, but the decision lacked a priority item for us, and that was the step raises. In 2009, we were asked to forego our wages and step increases. The wage concessions were not up for debate. If we refused, layoffs were promised, and layoffs meant the end of our ambulance program. We understood the wage freeze, but the act of freezing someone's step has to be one of the most demoralizing actions the city can take. This forces a small group of employees in any bargaining unit to sacrifice more than their peers. It pits the newer members against the senior members, and I view this action as a union-busting tactic that should not happen. It should not happen in a city that supports workers' rights. In order to accommodate the increase in our EMS call volume, we hired more employees who, in some cases, were being paid more than the members who were on the job with more time. More money to those members, more money to those members who are not in the step system or only at the entry level of the step system. Um, those members affected by the step raise took an average of $3,000 of concessions compared to the $1,500 that each of the other firefighters took. Back at the table, the city refused to address the pay disparity. Our proposal was simple and about fairness and that everyone makes the same sacrifices. The city would not consider our point and as a result, the negotiations broke down. Life at the firehouse was not great in the years that followed. We had a series of policy changes and other actions that negatively affected our members. Our staffing levels were held down, overtime opportunities were given away, and those same members in the step system had their steps frozen for a second time. Some of these actions were a violation of our contract, others a violation of the law. In almost all cases, we had to spend a significant amount of time and money protecting our rights. We accept the fact that this council had a legal right to reject the ruling of the arbitration panel. We understand it was a difficult decision for each and every one of you, and we only wish that you had given more consideration to the process that we had available to us. We had challenges that we simply could not resolve with the former administration, and the arbitration process was the only avenue in place to settle those disputes. Moving forward, I applaud Mayor Narkowitz for his leadership and his desire to find a solution to our unprecedented situation in a timely manner. We had two meetings in which we feel that the mayor was sincere and able to understand the complexity of this matter, and in turn, we listened as the mayor explained some of the financial and other challenges facing the city. Our members, who have been and will always be team players, were willing to accept the lower cost of living increase in turn for the city rectifying the pay disparity that resulted from the step freeze. As a result, we were able to collaborate with the mayor on a new contract in eight hours. Previously, it was three years and over $100,000 to reach an agreement that neither party were entirely happy with. This boils down to direct communication and leadership, and I again want to thank Mayor Narkowitz on his ability to demonstrate both. This resolution and new agreement came about in the spirit of fairness, and I commend my brothers and sisters for their professionalism and patience throughout this long and difficult road. Councilors, I urge you to approve these orders so our member and the city can move beyond this period. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a qualifier, I allowed um, President Flynn to go over because he was speaking for a lot of red T-shirts in here tonight, and I, uh, I believe this meeting is going to be much abbreviated by his remarks and other people not signing up, so I appreciate that. Uh, Mike Kirby, you're next. Uh, Mike Kirby, um, 134 North Street, Northampton. I'm here to ask you to think carefully about this rezoning measure and give us some more time and more thought. Because you have to think about it in terms of if a developer was coming into your neighborhood um, and was projecting a certain number of units to go in your particular neighborhood. You rely on the planning board to study the matter, to look at how many units are going in, what the existing streets are, are like, what the load is going to be on your infrastructure, on your sewers and everything. And here, you essentially have a 
proposal to redevelop a city, your neighborhood, everybody's neighborhood, to change the fundamental rules that regulate density and, and offsets. Small lots, it's going to mean a big change, well, about a 16% change when Smith develops Fort Hill, which they will. So essentially, what I think people would, li would have liked to see was for the planning board and the planning department to get an independent study to study the impact of this the same way the planning board requires a developer to, to put out an impact analysis to show what's going to happen when you change, when you have this particular density. And there really hasn't been any study. Um, there's been opinions on both sides. And we urge you, or I urge you, to take your time and to look at it carefully. And thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Nash. Hi, my name is Jim Nash of 18 Montview, and I was going to write a really great speech, but instead ended up driving my daughter to Deerfield. So I'm going off my notes here. Um, first of all, um, I want to start off by saying um, what's right with this zoning proposal. Um, shrinking the, the uh, dimensional standards, I'm okay with that. Um, I was a member of the ZRC, um, and that. Um, we looked at that and, you know, and, and I think that by and large people are okay with that. Um, that um, as far as expanding by right for URC and uh, URB to, uh, for URC to go from one to four fam one to four families by right, URB one to three families by right, I think people are fine with that. People are concerned about the in, uh, inequities of URA maintaining its one structure for for frontage, and um, and I, I I remain uh, concerned about that. Um, the tables for the zoning look great. Um, that um, the readable there's nice there's diagrams. Um, I appreciate the fact that Carolyn has a, a Porsche 911 in everybody's driveway, and that um, anybody knows that <laughs> mine's orange, um, and that. Um, the uh, design standards from the street are acceptable as well. And I think that what I'm saying is in agreement with a number of what people advocating for the, the zoning tonight are saying. They're saying this is okay. And, but at the same time, there's a number of people getting up and they're talking about, yeah, that's okay. I'm okay with the, woman, the people on Olive Street who want to subdivide. You know, we're, we're okay with that. What we're concerned about, and we've seen this in, down in, in our neighborhood, where we have this issue with attached structures, which was also mentioned by some of the advocates that, for this proposal, that, um, that they can go on and on into a property and that, um, and that they don't fit into a neighborhood. And that um, that, that is the piece that's missing and I, I've called them design standards. They can be lot layout. They could be whatever. But we don't want to be encouraging development into people's backyards. Um, in closing, I'm, the, I'm from St. Louis. And St. Louis has urban sprawl galore. You know, you can get out and you can drive on the highways and you can see the, um, the condos. Um, here, we're, we're struggling a bit with that issue. But in the center of our city, we've been gifted a beautiful urban, pre-World War II urban core. And we're talking about tinkering around with that. And I think we need to take our time on it and do it correctly. I think we should move forward with the, the changes these people want. But things beyond that, I, I think we really need to send that back and have that more seriously looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim was the last person on the list. Does anyone else wish to speak at this time? 
I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. <coughs> Here. Councilor Carter. Present. Councilor White. Here. Councilor Trader Daniel. Here. Councilor Barr. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Stewart. Here. 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 Um, there's a few things I'm, uh, before we get started. I want to ask the council if they would consider a reordering of the agenda in order to facilitate uh, and accommodate a large amount of people here. One of the things would be to actually move up to Finance Committee ASAP, um, deal with the financial orders of the mayor's transfers, and then hopefully vote on that after, uh, vote on the, at least the transfer afterwards when it hits the floor. Um, the, and then the other thing is to move, you'll see that the, <coughs> the um, ordinances that the uh, zoning we've moved up in the, uh, and the order of that was so the week because given based on the the comments and we do have some presentations also we have uh, two presentations but given the given the comments that were uh, presented it would seem that the audience has two principal interests and I'd like to get to those first so that we don't condemn people to those hard chairs till 11 o'clock tonight good idea and, and is everyone okay with that yeah yes okay my straw poll says yay so <clears throat> why don't we you want to what do you think we should we'll go recess right into finance and that means passing the gavel figuratively to <clears throat> chair of finance uh, Councilor Murphy uh, Mary would you call a roll of finance please Murphy? here Murphy. here present mm -hmm. thank you our first order of business in finance upon the recommendation of the planning board in the office of planning and sustainability whereas the sustainable northampton comprehensive plan adopted by this council the planning board and other city boards and commissions includes a city policy of accommodating bicycles pedestrians along every street also known as a complete streets policy and whereas in 2011 the city hired Nelson Nygaard Associates to conduct a design charrette to create a comprehensive vision for King Street and Main Street as complete streets to accommodate the traffic volume bicycles and pedestrians and whereas consistent with those visions the planning board has to date accepted donations of strips of property in fee or by easement to accommodate current and future pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure on three properties along King Street Leah Kia Northampton Crossing and Northampton Volkswagen Country Hyundai as part of the traffic mitigation required under Northampton zoning and therefore now be it ordered that the mayor is authorized to accept easements for fee simple title to strips of land along King Street to accommodate off offered donations and future donations on King Street we hear a motion on this one that move to recommend second all right any discussion uh, hearing none all in favor of a positive recommendation to full council Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Our second order is the purchase of land to add to the Saw Mill Hills Conservation Area. Upon the recommendation of the Conservation Commission, be it ordered, whereas the Open Space Recreation and Multi Use Plan 2011 to 2019 recommends expanding the Sawmill Hills Conservation Area and eventually linking it to the Mineral Hills. And whereas the Sumansky family has agreed to sell 58.216 acres off Sylvester Road map ID 28-10 for $232,864. And whereas this acquisition is the Conservation Commission's top acquisition priority and will fill a major wildlife and ecological gap in some of the most ecologically valuable land in the city and whereas all acquisition funds will be drawn from grants and donations and none from the city general revenue now therefore it be ordered that the conservation commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided in section 8c of chapter 40 of the general laws the community <coughs> preservation act and article 97 of the amendments to the massachusetts constitution any fee easement or conservation restriction as defined in section 31 of chapter 184 of the general laws or any other interest in the above land and any and immediately adjoining land 
and that the city is authorized to accept and expand grants and donations for that purpose, that the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restrictions, and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions on any land so acquired. Move motion? to recommend. Second it. Second. Any further discussion in finance? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Upon the recommendation of Mayor David Narkowitz, order that for the purposes of funding retroactive wa wages totaling $316,394 as part of a collective bargaining agreement between the City of Northampton and Northampton Firefighters Local 108 for fiscal year 2011, 12, and 13. The amount of 264566 is to be appropriated from the Stabilization Fund and that the amount of 51000 828 as a budgetary transfer from the FY14 reserve for personnel account to the FY14 fire department retro payments account. Move to recommend. On this one? Any discussion on this? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And the second part of this, upon the recommendation of David, Mayor David Narkowitz, order that the following FY 2014 budgetary transfers are made to the fire department. Transferring from reserve for personnel wage adjustments, $130,172. Fire department overtime, $40,234. Uh, 40, Those are being transferred to permanent salaries, 137,304, and to stipends, 33,000. 102 for a total of $170,406. Move to approve. Second. Second. Any more discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And that completes the agenda for finance. Move to adjourn finance. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <coughs> that was fun, huh? That was a <laughs> secret cabal. Um, believe it or not, I'd actually like to wait. Councilor Tacey said that he was going to be delayed, and I think it's appropriate that he be here for this vote. So if everyone can hold on for him, we can we can all watch him as he walks in. I'm sure that'll make him feel really comfortable. Um, <laughs> but I would prefer to have the full council vote on this, and I know that Councilor Tacey wanted to vote on this. So the, the only thing I would add, I'm not against that, count, uh, Mr. President, but. I think we should set a time on that just in case the council doesn't come. So if we could have a, uh, a yes, fair enough, time. Uh, eight o'clock. Is that good? Yeah, maybe we can give it a little more because he said he'd be here by eight. Well, what so I was thinking we do we slip in our presentations. Okay. okay. How about that? Okay. We're gonna we're gonna do the we're gonna we're really juggling the agenda here, but the, I, I'm gonna move up the presentations uh, back to the original order, and that will give Councilor Tacey some time to Great. come in and, and weigh in. Um, First up, um, right, okay, okay. So yes, this is this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, Council Jesse Adams, Council William H. Dwight, Council Pamela C. Schwartz, Council Paul D. Spector, and the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission. Uh, this is a resolution on fossil fuel divestment. Or is global warming caused primarily by the burning of fossil fuels is a serious threat to current and future generations in Northampton and around the world. And whereas global warming is already causing costly disruption of human and natural systems both in Northampton and throughout the world, including the increase in extreme weather leading to power failures, flooding, drought, uh, food and water shortages, property damage and death, the acidification of oceans and the rapid melting of the Arctic ice and rise in sea levels causing devastation of coastal areas and whereas the effects of global warming will further intensify with increased temperatures such that almost every government in the world, including the United States, has agreed through the 2009 Copenhagen Accord that any warming above a 2 degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit rise would be unsafe for human habitation. And whereas scientists estimate that humans can emit only approximately 565 more gigatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and still retain a reasonable hope of not exceeding the 2 degree centigrade of global warming. And whereas proven coal, oil, and gas reserves of the fossil fuel companies and the countries that act like fossil fuel companies 
equals about 2,795 gigatons of CO2, or five times the maximum amount we can release to prevent more than a two degree centigrade of warming. And whereas for the purpose of this ordinance, a fossil fuel company shall be defined as any of the 200 publicly traded companies with the largest coal, oil, and gas reserves as measured by the gigatons of carbon dioxide that would be uh, emitted if those reserves were extracted and burned, such as those companies listed in the Carbon Trackers Initiative Unburnable Coal Report, um, Unburnable Carbon Report, and whereas fossil fuel companies operate for maximum short-term profit at the expense of long-term sustainability, spend vast sums of money to influence government in order to avoid paying the true cost of the environmental damage they cause, and continue to explore for even more fossil fuel deposits that could not be burned without drastic acceleration of a runaway climate change. And whereas the City of Northampton has a moral duty to protect the lives and livelihoods of its inhabitants from the threat of global warming, and believes that its investments should support a future where citizens can live healthy lives without the catastrophic impacts of a warming environment. And whereas there is a national movement underway to divest from fossil fuel companies as both a moral action and a means of weakening the political influence of the fossil fuel industry with, so far, 12 U.S. municipalities, including Seattle and San Francisco, resolving to divest their portfolios of fossil fuel companies and hundreds of religious and higher learning institutions actively considering such divestment. And whereas leadership is critical to build national momentum for a movement to divest from fossil fuel companies. And whereas Northampton is a proven leader in sustainability, having articulated and demonstrated this leadership in various ways, such as the Sustainable Northampton Master Plan, membership in the city's climate protection, designation as the Massachusetts community, the Solarize Northampton program, expansion of bicycle pedestrian infrastructure, construction of LEED certified municipal buildings, etc. And whereas the President of the United States has called upon citizens to make climate change an urgent priority for action in their communities, including investment in clean, renewable energy and divestment from dirty fossil fuels. And therefore, be it resolved that the City, of the, the city Council of the City of Northampton urges the City's Retirement Board and the City Treasurer of Northampton to review their investment portfolios in order to identify any holdings that include direct or indirect investments in fossil fuel <coughs> companies and be it further resolved that the City Council urges the Retirement Board and the City Treasurer to immediately cease and adopt policies precluding any new investments in fossil fuel companies that include holdings in fossil fuel companies and be it further resolved that the City of Northampton urges the Retirement Board and the City Treasurer di to divest of it's uh, directly or indirectly held assets and <coughs> holding fossil fuel public equities and corporate bonds within five years. It would be a further resolved that for any Northampton investments in mutual funds or ETFs that include fossil fuel companies, the City Council urges the Retirement Board and the City Treasurer to contact the respective investment advisors to request that they notify fund managers of the City's desire to remove fossil fuel companies from all investment products and be it further resolved that the City Council urges the Retirement Board and the City Treasurer to release yearly updates available to the public detailing progress made towards full divestment and be it further resolved that the City Council endorses proposed state legislation requiring divestment of statewide retirement funds, pension reserves investment trusts uh, from fossil fuel companies and precluding such investment in the future. And the President of the City Council will send this resolution and letters of support for divestment legislation to elected officials, including Senator Rosenberg, Representative Kokot, Governor Patrick, Steve Grossman, the Treasurer of the Commonwealth. Um, and that, will, by way of introduction, is to the presentation. We have Adele Franks here and Lily Lombard is here as well to, to speak to this issue. And Adele, welcome. Thank you. I think the resolution pretty much speaks for itself, but I thought I would at least emphasize a couple of, of the important points. One is that climate change is an urgent issue. We would have no time to lose. The uh, impact of climate disruption is already occurring faster than the scientists predicted. So we have to do everything we can right now to reduce carbon emissions if we're going to have any hope of a livable future for our offspring and their offspring. We're very proud of Northampton and of Massachusetts for leadership in clean energy and energy conservation, but that really isn't enough. We have to go further. 
We're asking uh, Northampton to take a stand against investing public funds in dirty energy companies because they basically are stealing from us in many ways. First of all, the dirty fuel industry does not pay for the environmental destruction that it causes. The public pays for that. It does not pay for the carbon pollution it dumps into our atmosphere and accelerates climate change. The increasingly severe and frequent storms that we have are the cleanup is paid for by us, the municipalities and therefore the public. The industry does not pay for the illnesses that its emissions cause. The public pays for that. And it doesn't even pay the full cost of doing its own business because it gets government subsidies to do its own business, which means that the public is paying for that as well. And perhaps most unconscionably, if that's a word, um, it's using its record-breaking profits to influence our government, both federal and state government, by lobbying against incentives for clean energy companies to be able to do their business on a level playing field. So the real question is, why would any community want to invest its public funds in an industry like that? So the proposed resolution that you have before you tonight asks Northampton to create a clear policy that we will not now or ever invest our public funds in the dirty fossil fuel industry that acts so clearly against our best interests and violates our values and allow Northampton to take its rightful place among the dozen or so communities across the United States that are taking a strong position of leadership on this important issue. We thank you for uh, allowing us time in this very busy agenda that you have tonight, and uh, we'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Any questions from the council? Uh, Councilor Carmen? Well, more a comment than a question, just that um, I appreciate the, uh, the strategy. It's been used and very successfully in a number of ways as a political tool to ask divestment of, um, of funds, and uh, I, I'm happy to support this if it helps. Thank you. It, it should be pointed out that, rather unusually, the President of the United States called for divestment, uh, divestment pressure on fossil fuel companies, uh, encouraging municipalities and communities across the country and institutions to consider divestment of uh, fossil fuel assets and investment in uh, the expansion of green technology also it's projected that in the next 23 years that the fossil fuel companies are going to invest 200 and, I, I mean uh, something like 275 trillion dollars in the exploration and processing of, of carbon-based uh, fossil fuels that's compared to the $72 trillion that are going to be invested in alternative fuels, at least projected out. You can see that the, the level playing field that Adele was talking about doesn't exist even close at this point, and there is a sense of urgency. Um, any other questions? Uh, Councilor Schwartz? Questions and or comments? Or sure. Are we saving comments for yeah, a different no, time? No. Okay. Um, so I just want to thank you um, and and – Lily Lombard as well, um, for the initiative and the leadership on this, and um, really happy to be a co-sponsor and uh, with the Energy Commission. And I, I feel that uh, it is uh, an opportunity, you've, you've provided through your leadership an opportunity for us to do our part, and I'm hopeful that we will all support it and be counted among those dozens and add to the numbers. So thank you. I'll add one more thing. We, we, we've taken a lot of knocks lately for our resolutions. Of course, it distracts us from the, the real business at hand, and the city's going to hell in a handbasket because we're dabbling in larger global politics. I want to bring it home. We're also going to be talking tonight about a stormwater management fee. It's actually prompted by the Army Corps of Engineers' concern for the increased severity of storms, particularly after in the wake of Katrina. We have a structure, an infrastructure very similar to what New Orleans had. Consequently, we are obliged to pay for that. And that, the direct corollary of uh, uh, the, the connection, if you will, for the community here, is that there is a cause and effect. And we are being, we are being just as you said, the cost is going to be borne by us, a significant cost, to support and protect ourselves 
from increased severity of storms and in order to meet and accommodate the, the federal standards that are being applied. So there is, this isn't too airy fairy pie in the sky type of uh, resolution. This is down to earth, affects us directly here, and, and I, I agree. This is our moral responsibility. Any other comments or questions for Adele? Thank you, Adele. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, the, I'll accept a motion on the resolution. Vote to approve. Second. Thanks for the discussion. All those in favor of the resolution, first reading? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? I will abstain. Councilor Murphy abstains? Two abstentions. Two abstentions. Councilor Tacey abstains as well. Um, well, Councilor Tacey is here. So, uh, Chris, if you'll bear with us, we're going to skip your presentation and move on to that. We're going, uh, we're going to go right up in the order, uh, the financial order that was referred, the two financial orders that were referred. The mayor is here also to speak to that. And, Your Honor, if you, uh, as we introduce this to the floor, uh, first off, uh, let's go in order. Yeah. Uh, no, just the two financial orders relative to the transfer for the fire. Okay. This is uh, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narquist ordered that for the purpose of funding retroactive wages totaling $316,394 as a part of collective bargaining agreement CBA between the City of Northampton and the Northampton Firefighters IAFF Local 108 for FY 2011, FY 2012, and FY 2013. The amount of $264,566 is appropriated from the stabilization fund, <coughs> and the amount of $51,828 is a budgetary transfer from the FY14 reserve for personnel <coughs> uh, to the FY14 fire department retro payments account. And I'll accept the motion. I move approval. Second. Second. Okay. Your Honor, do you want to? Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, honorable members of the City Council. Um, so um, I provided a memo uh, in the packet with these two orders that provides a, a detailed breakdown. Um, but just more generally speaking, um, obviously at your last meeting, uh, your decision on the um, arbitration award meant that uh, the city and, uh, and uh, Northampton firefighters, uh, IAFF Local 108, needed to go back to the, to the bargaining table to try to work out uh, an agreement. And I want to um, commend uh, President Scott Flynn and, and, and Vice President uh, Sean Denkevich uh, for, and, and the leadership and the membership of, of uh, Local 108. Um, we, we came together uh, following that, uh, that last council meeting. Um, we had a very good uh, meeting um, on August 1st. Uh, to sort of uh, reassess, take stock, uh, try to figure out a way forward, um, to really figure out a way to work collaboratively together. Um, we actually uh, came to the agreement that we would, um, uh, we had a state mediator that had been assigned to us by the DLR, um, as well as our respective legal counsel. We uh, agreed that, the, that we would try to um, you know, we would try to work this out without their assistance. Uh, Chief Duggan was also part of this meeting, so myself, Chief Duggan, and the President and Vice President of Local 108. The other thing that I committed to is that I would come back to the City Council, and obviously you know we held an executive session uh, on August 5th, uh, Monday, August 5th, in which I had the opportunity, as, I'm, as we are allowed under state law, to discuss collective bargaining strategy uh, in executive session. Um, to talk with you about m my strategy, my options, and, uh, and the type of an agreement that uh, I could bring back to the City Council. Uh, we then had a meeting um, uh, on August 7th. Um, uh, this was the meeting at which uh, myself and Chief Duggan uh, and, uh, and President Flynn and Vice President Dankevich uh, met um, in my office, uh, again, without our respective council or the mediator. Um, that was a very long but productive meeting um, where we were really able to talk through some of the issues and really try to problem solve and come up with uh, some solutions. So what I'm, uh, what I'm presenting to you tonight, the financial orders, um, will allow the city to fund 
a, um, a, a both a three-year agreement for the retroactive period of FY11, FY12, and FY13. We've also reached a second three-year agreement uh, that will bring us from the current fiscal year, FY14, through uh, FY16. Um, and so it's a s two three-year agreements or a total six-year period. Um, the orders that I've put before you uh, allow us to be able to make the retroactive um, salary adjustments for uh, 11, 12, and 13. It also allows us uh, to uh, fulfill the other commitments that we've made to as part of the contract uh, beginning in FY14, which is to uh, provide the step movement uh, for nine uh, uh, members of Local 108. Um, and I, uh, Firefighter Flynn referred to that issue in his remarks, and I've spoken with you about it. It's this issue of uh, step movement for folks who are behind a step um, because of the concessions that were made in FY uh, 2010. Um, and it also includes um, uh, the, the, um, the uh, agreed upon COLA for FY 14, which was not part of what I brought you uh, on July 11th. And that's a 1% COLA on January 1st, which uh, effectively requires a 0.5% uh, increase in, in uh, salaries for FY14. Um, so that's the package in terms of how it's arranged. Obviously, uh, this first order that's before you is made up of a combination of stabilization funds as well as the reserve for personnel account, which we had used to budget for a potential uh, contract settlement. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I, um, I think this is a very positive development in terms of our being able to obviously move beyond uh, the past uh, and be able to look forward with some stability both for the city as well as for Local 108 uh, and for uh, their members and their families. Um, and I also think it was a, 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 an example of um, really the two parties putting aside all those uh, past differences, um, some of which some of us weren't even party to or there uh, when they were happening, and really being able to say, okay, how do we solve this problem uh, and how do we figure out a solution? Uh, and so I think what you have before you um, will, help us, uh, will help us finalize that solution. And again, I would uh, strongly urge that the City Council approve uh, these transfers so that we can ratify the contract from the city's perspective and again move forward uh, working on the important issues that we need to work on uh, as a city and as a fire department. Any questions? Uh, Councilor Tayson and Councilor Labarge yeah. and then Councilor Freeman. -Dance. So the <coughs> the firefighters in that were let's say disenfranchised in 2010 we've made them whole. Uh, well again I have to I have to be clear um, we're not going back into FY10 to, a, to reopen a contract or go back and do that. Um, <clears throat> what, we're, what we're attempting to do is uh, mitigate the effects of that um, uh, and in, in for nine, uh, for nine uh, members in particular, um, they have, uh, by, the, by moving them up one step, um, it, it it eliminates the situation where someone who was hired in FY10, someone who was hired in FY11 are on the same step. And in some cases, because of other uh, uh, pay situations, you may have, um, I think I hear myself, uh, I, you may have a situation where someone who has been working uh, uh, longer is making less than that particular individual, again, because of the step placement. So it allows us to do that, to fix that again. That's effective July 1st of FY14. Uh, it's not retroactive to, to FY10. And then in a, uh, another provision of the agreement that is future funded, uh, we will, uh, uh, for a, a, another universe of uh, local 8, 108 members who are affected uh, in terms of the going forward from 10, there will be a lump sum uh, that will be paid to them. Again, in uh, the agreement specifies in, for FY15, uh, but we can do that whenever we want, but FY15. Um, and that will um, make up the lost wages for the members for those three years. Uh, that, again, just those that were affected by it. Um, so that's, the, that's sort of the solution we came up to. And again, the COLAs 
uh, for the years in question. Uh, you have that information in my memo. So, <clears throat> so we've spread this. We spread this out. I don't want to get into 15 and 16, but we've we've made it easier. We've lessened the impact in fiscal year 14. Uh, uh, in terms of what we have to uh, pay for and what I'm requesting from you tonight, both from the stabilization fund as well as from within the FY14 budget, yes, it's a lower lower amount in terms of both orders that I'm bringing forward uh, to you tonight um, to be able to fund that. And, and by having a longer term contract, uh, uh, you know, we've been able to uh, go over a longer period of time. Um, and and so that's that's the agreement. Um, and in terms of the other parts of the contract, the COLA parts of it, again, uh, trying to work to that three percent uh, COLA that was given up in one year, try to represent that as part of what we do, of, have agreed to um, over the over the span of three retroactive years. So in terms of and and. Uh, uh, the, uh, patrol officers than the police department this creates sort of parity for those three years in terms of the cola levels uh four percent over those uh four years seems to it almost exact on the uh, numbers. Uh, well in terms of adding up the yeah. percentages that's correct okay thank you council the barge yes um i'm gonna do this quickly mary narkowitz i want to thank you personally for acting quickly on this ruling there has been many concerns of the previous JLMC ruling, and as a consular, many residents were concerned of the amount of money and the use of override money. I want to thank especially Scott Flynn, President and its leaders, and Chief Brian Duggan of Local 108 for working with our mayor to come to a good resolution. June 5th, we went into executive session like our mayor just had mentioned, which I felt was a great, a great way to air consular's concerns and be able to suggest in promoting equity and physical stability, both in sound and serves the city's best interest. And that also gives our firefighters their due retroactive that is deserved to them. June 7th, the mayor and Local 108 worked out a resolution that took many hours, and we heard of that, and how long that you spent trying to make a good resolution. I feel that it's been a long road, a long road for all our firemen and firewomen. And it's been very difficult for us consulars of not knowing exactly what was occurring way back I feel that we have opened the communication that we did not have and you did not have I have always supported our firemen and firewomen you are the best these men and women risk their lives every day for our safety they have been working with out a fair contract for three years and tonight I will support this new orders and I will support in doing two readings on these orders that the mayor has brought forth. I want to thank you for your dedication to the welfare and the safety of our city. And thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Fiend James. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, my reading of this uh, order has it partial appropriation partial transfer that's correct so do we need we need six votes to pass this by 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 charter you need six votes uh really technically i think we, as we've looked at that part of the charter um even transfers the use of the term appropriation really is any financial transaction that the council done has done right. as, as we've looked at the chart language i've asked the city solicitor to look at that and as it's written i i've Fairly confident that any financial no distinction between no. Tra transfer and appropriation no, in terms of uh, in terms of what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, uh, Council Murphy? Yes, I'd like to thank uh, the local 108 members for their patience and the willingness to continue to negotiate. I'd like to thank the mayor for both his sensitivity to the needs of our firefighters and also to the fiscal constraints of the city. 
Um, I'm glad you're both happy with the settlement. I am, and I'm very much going to support it. Two readings tonight. Council Adams. Um, I, want, I, I support this entirely. <coughs> and the two transfers will save about $140,000. So, um, and, and I appreciate that. And it also gives the union a little more stability um, looking towards the future. I do appreciate that this was negotiated here rather than an, an outside committee agency trying to make the determination as to what we can afford. That's always difficult. And I do believe that this, this is more in line with um, the city union contracts over the past three years, particularly the patrol officers union. And I want to thank the union and the mayor and the union particularly for, um, despite the disappointment that you felt over our last vote, uh, your willingness to to keep negotiating and uh, throughout the entire several year period where the contracts were open and there were negotiations um, that I want to thank you. The quality of service has never wavered during that period. Councilor Schwartz. I too will support these orders. I'm so grateful and relieved that we're here um, with this opportunity to have that vote and I thank you mayor and I thank you local 108 and uh, the leadership for making this opportunity possible. I unfortunately had to miss the July meeting. I was out of town and uh, and I was uh, uncomfortable on, with, from every point of view with what we were faced, what the council was faced with that night, both in terms of the cost, but the desire to resolve the firefighter contract. And, um, and I, I would have voted no had I been there with the hope that we would be here where we are tonight. Um, and we're here. And I'm so happy about that. And I look forward to giving this my yes vote. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Yeah, and I want to thank everybody, too. <laughs> this, is, this is palatable. This is tenable. I, I, I did believe that the other at the time was not, it was just, too much, too quick, and, and the impact on fiscal year 14 was my, my biggest concern, but I will support this tonight. And thank you very much, everybody. Anyone else? And I would just add that I, 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 I believe I requested in the agenda, two but I, I did mm -hmm. make a commitment that I would advocate for two readings. I believe mm -hmm. that I'm this is an issue that's been very process. well aired. <laughs> Uh, There's a good chance over the last 30 days. So. I think that will survive. Uh, for <laughs> folks who are paying attention, normally what we would do is we would do one reading vote, and then you'd have to wait until the next council meeting for the second reading. I think it's likely we're going to spare you that. Um, we'll do it all all tonight. Um, any other comments from the council on this particular order? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Aye. Yes. 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 Move to suspend rules for second reading. Suspend second rule 14. There's a motion to suspend rules for second reading. All those in favor? Please. Aye. 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 Move second reading. Second it. All right. Roll call, please. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Aye. Unanimously approved. Thank you all very much. Uh, we're, there is, we have part two. We do have part two. I mean, there is a little bit of suspense left. But, uh, the, the, uh, this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. The following FY 2014 budgetary transfers are made to the fire department. Reserve for personnel wage adjustment. Uh, the uh, of $130,172, uh, fire department overtime, $40,234, uh, fire department salaries to be transferred to $137,304, and the fire department stipends, uh, $33,102 for a total of $170,406. Move to approve. Second. Discussion. Mayor, do you want to speak to this a little bit? No, again, this is again the, now that the retro has been approved, uh, this order moves money into the FY14 budget uh, to be able to accommodate the increases uh, in wages. And then, of course, there's the component of the FY14 uh, collective bargaining 
agreement and funding those in and of themselves, uh, as well as that um, the, the issues of the step placement that I mentioned. Uh, the step placement also has a small financial cost. So it's, it's all of those uh, pieces, both retroactive plus the new pieces that are part of the second three-year agreement. Paul, please. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Accept the motion. Suspend rule 14. Second. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Move second reading. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Councilor Freeman Daniel. Aye. Councilor Barge. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. Yes. Now it's done. It's done. <laughs> Thank you, counselors. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, as we wait for the room to clear, what we can do is we can have uh, Chris Mason fight his way to the podium. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll do that and then we'll do the one. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. Excellent. I always enjoy watching the city council proceedings. <laughs> But that's you got a great mix so it's very special. Yeah. <laughs> you enjoy watching as Councilman said, you enjoy watching sausage being made. As, you know. <laughs> it's very participatory, yes. It's a wonderful community. Um, okay, well I want to thank the City Council for giving me the opportunity to let you know of uh, an event that's coming up. Um, although I've spoken with many of you individually, so you already know, but in general, I mean in, in public. Um, the Northampton Clean Energy Community Forum that will be taking place next Wednesday, August 21st at the Senior Center from 7 to 9. And uh, as you know, uh, Mayor Narkowitz and the city is inviting the members of the community to come and share ideas on ways that we can expand our energy efficiency and renewable energy efforts out to the entire community so we can significantly improve energy efficiency and tap into renewable energy in all sectors of our community. Um, as you know, uh, as, as you've seen in, in the past, the city's done a lot already, uh, particularly on its own infrastructure. We've uh, taken uh, major investments in energy efficiency. We've uh, put, uh, put in place a number of solar arrays in the community, um, and those efforts are continuing. Uh, we haven't gotten uh, as much out of it as we want to, but we're continuing with that. Um, and we've also taken a few small steps to help our businesses and help our residents uh, improve their energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy. Uh, we've partnered with utilities to establish a business energy coach um, uh, within a local not-for-profit who is available to help any of our local businesses access utility rebates um, funds and to take part in utility uh, energy efficiency programs. Um, right now we have the Solarized Northampton program uh, happening to uh, help our residents uh, adopt renewable energy, and that is um, uh, being incredibly successful. I see the weekly metrics come in uh, compared to the rest of the communities and across Northampton, and I can't share specifics, but I can say Northampton is, it, it, we're, we're shining. <laughs> uh, Northampton is really taking this opportunity to, to move for solar energy. But we know that these are just a start. Uh, the divestment resolution you held tonight, um, I personally want to thank you for that. Um, uh, I think that's uh, a, a really good approach to try to dampen down the carbon emissions that are, are happening. But at the same time, we all know we need to move towards reducing our energy use in general and moving towards renewable energy. And those, we need some very practical ways to do that. So um, uh, the city and, and for this effort, for this Clean Energy Community Forum, uh, city staff are working with a group of, uh, a working group of 15 uh, folks who um, have connections with our rural neighborhoods, our faith community, our energy contractors and efficiency advocates, our low-income residents, our seniors, emergency planning and medical community, 
Smith College, the business community, our economic development um, office, and our city planning. And we are also working with two of our state agencies, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and the State Department of Energy Resources. We plan to use this effort, this effort to identify ways that we can move toward renewable energy and energy efficiency throughout our community. They plan to use these efforts to identify state resources that can help us implement the strategies that we come up with. Um, in the August 21st forum uh, is the first of two forums, and they will focus on identifying potential strategies that would work in Northampton. So the invitation is to come out and share your ideas, hear what other people's ideas are. I think that'll generate even more ideas. We're trying to bring in um, uh, the raw information. We have ideas, you know, the grants come out, we apply for grants. Um, there are uh, the Sustainable Northampton Plan listed in a number of um, actions that the Northampton Energy Commission and the city are, are working on. Um, and yet, we know we don't have all the answers. And we know if we ask the community, the, the uh, residents and the business people, you know, how, what is going to be the best way? Ask them personally, how can we move to, uh, towards higher levels of energy efficiency and renewable energy in their businesses, in their residents, in their homes? Um, we're hoping to get some good ideas. Uh, from there, uh, the city staff, um, our state partners, uh, the working group of 15 folks in the Energy Commission will take these ideas and turn them into proposed, uh, concrete proposed actions which we're going to bring back to the community in a second forum in early October. Um, and then uh, after reviewing uh, the concrete uh, proposals with the community at that forum, we will come back again with the working group, the Mass Clean Energy Center will draft a clean energy roadmap uh, that we can use. Uh, and they will identify ways the state can help us put those actions uh, in uh, those, those, those plans into action. So one of the beautiful things about this program is a pilot program the Clean Energy Center is trying to run um, is that we have the state at the table with us. And you can tell when I've been at some of the meetings with the Clean Energy Center in particular, they're trying to figure out how best to help the communities. And so they're going to use this as an opportunity to figure out how can we help you move forward. Um, so Northampton's got the opportunity to be one of the communities. Uh, Franklin Regional Council Governments is doing this with a number of the towns up in Franklin County. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is doing this with a number of towns um, uh, down in the lower part of the valley. Northampton is one of two communities where we're doing it specifically with one with the city. So we get very direct um, uh, attention here from the two, two state agencies. Um, and so again, it's August 21st, next Wednesday. It's a forum for community input. Uh, I have. Uh, even though a number of counselors here have already tried to help me reach out to their uh, their constituents, I'd like to pass out some postcards. Um, and I invite the counselors to take a couple, you know, a dozen, however many they think they could use, uh, would like to use to help, again, let your constituents know about this. Um, anything that's left at the end, please set it up here for anybody else to take it out. And I'll stop by tomorrow morning. And, and pick up whatever's left. Um, uh, I, I love the proceedings here, but I am going to take the opportunity to go home after. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, and, I, and at last, I want to thank all the counselors who have already helped me uh, spread the word on this. And I hope we have a really good uh, turnout next Wednesday. Uh, it's going to be launching our next efforts to, to move energy efficiency and renewable energy into the greater community. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Councilor Tacey. I want to thank you for doing this. I've been buried here lately and this is the one thing that I haven't had a chance to even look into but um, it's important thank you very much I'm looking at solar uh, house in the garage now so right. we'll see what happens through the solarized program yes okay. mm -hmm. it's very good prices <laughs> it, it's unbelievable yes it is it is rather that's actually a word you could use for it yes the, uh, the, the thermometer uh, sign outside the uh, it's outside the UU, isn't it? Or it's uh, it's Memorial outside Hall. The Memorial Hall. Hall, yeah. Yes. It's uh, bursting and overflowing, indicating that uh, exceeding the goal and, and then right. some. We, um, um, it, it didn't get to our community in time for us. We were already pushing Tier 5 when it got here, and by the time we got it up on the lawn, we were over Tier 5. And um, uh, I'm hoping that the Solarize people will continue to put the numbers, you know, that the Tier 5 was when you got to 200 kilowatts. We're 
pushing 300 kilowatts now. So um, I, I think we're going to go quite a bit higher. Than that. So you mean you've you've broken the mold? Uh, no, actually, a few other communities last year, larger communities than us, uh, we're still pushing to to match them. But I wouldn't be surprised if Northampton matched the larger communities. Per capita. Per capita, yes. Uh, Council Labarge. Yes. How many residents do you think probably will show up at this forum? Um, the. Uh, uh, there's a uh, consulting group that's helping the Mass Clean Energy Center with this, and they've held one forum already, um, and they've, they're asking for uh, registrations or RSVPs. It's not required. They're just trying to keep track of it. They, kept, they try to keep track of it. And we have exceeded the number of signups they had uh, for that forum, and they had 60 participants. So uh, we were all along thinking that we would get between 70 and 100. And I think we're on track to get uh, to get about that many. That's excellent. And yeah. thank you for all your hard work all in your group. Thank you, Chris. You can go home. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the proceedings. Um, why don't we, uh, we one minute announcements and then, um, then we'll figure. Uh, do one minute announcements and then I think it would be appropriate to take a break after yes. that and then we can come back and discuss. Sony. Um, so, any one minute announcements from the counselors? No? Mm -hmm. Scouring your brains? I, I, I want to reiterate what Jen said about uh, the alfresco screening of Princess Bride Friday night at the high school. This is NCTV, is, produces this, and it's actually, we don't have a movie theater anymore. It's the closest thing we're going to have to that. And this is a great community movie theater, and uh, and actually, by my reckoning, a great movie. So, any other announcements? Okay, uh, we'll break for seven minutes, and then return here to reconvene to discuss the zone. Welcome back, um, City Council President Bill Dwight. This is City Council meeting of the City of Northampton, August fifteenth, twenty thirteen, and we are coming out of recess. And back to the agenda, uh, we have decided that, uh, we're juggling the order of the agenda tonight to accommodate our bigger issues and also the ones that folks are present here for the most part in, uh, in council chambers. So um, we're going to move to orders and ordinances. Um, the, and actually, I'd like to deal with the first one in order, in proper order, just since it's there. And that's a uh, warrant for preliminary election on September 17th, 2013. I'm sorry, and, and this is unfair because I didn't warn Mary. <laughs> uh, order that a meeting of the inhabitants of the city of Northampton qualified to vote will be held on Tuesday, September 17th, 2013 in the several polling places designated for the purpose by the city council as follows. Ward 6, Precinct A in Robert K. A. Uh, Finn Ryan Road School. Oddly enough, Ward 6, Precinct B also in Robert K. Finn Ryan Road School. The polls will be opened at 7 o'clock in the forenoon and close at 8 o'clock in the evening of the said day. And all such members will be in the several wards and precincts in which they are individually entitled to vote, just this one, uh, between said hours, given their votes for the nomination of candidates for the councilor from Ward 6. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? This is the preliminary that's been, there are three candidates now for office in Ward 6, and now there has to be a preliminary election to the two candidates for the September. November election. Any other, uh, Councilor Freeman Davis? Just saying, if we had changed the charter, we wouldn't have to do this. There we go. To run off. Whoa, just. That dog won't let that bone go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any opposition? So ordered. She's asking for two oh. readings, so suspend rule 14. Second. Second. All right. There's been Seconded a motion to suspend you rules. Should, all those in favor of suspending <laughs> rules, please say aye. 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 And I will wake up the dog again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Move second reading. Second. All those in favor of uh, yeah, Council Freeman Daniels. <laughs> Just saying it is, you know. First, I need to second it. <laughs> it is expensive, you know. You know it costs money, and, uh, you know, 
I think it's better than a uh, binary option. You know. Point made and taken twice. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> All those opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? There was uh, one wolf in that. I think I counted. <laughs> Um, all right, let's get to work. Zoning. Carolyn, uh, I would ask the council to recognize Carolyn Nish. Move to recognize Carolyn. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carolyn. <laughs> the mayor is always recognized, so we can call him at any point just for fun. <laughs> just, just to keep him here. Mr. President, do you want to put all of these on the table first, or do you want to? What's, what's the council's preference? preference? I would move them as a group. Second. Yeah, I would say. All right. Second. That's two, three, and That's four. That's two, three, and four changes to table of dimensions and uses in A, B, and C. And five. Right. Yeah, one. Well, I'll throw in five, too. Five? Okay. All right, so that's... Uh, the motion is to move them as a group. All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 All right. Opposed? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so what's your preference now, Councilor? Do you have uh... Well, they've been moved as a group. Okay. Yeah. So, right. That was my preference. So, Carolyn is here. Uh, Carolyn, do you have, you want to speak to this first and then open up to questions, or you just want questions? Uh, well, it would be great if I could um, review. This has been sort of floating around in front of you all for a couple of months now, and I think um, through that time, questions have come up, so I thought it'd be good to sort of refresh everyone's memory about this and go through. I'll um, try to be expedited, but stop me uh, if you have questions about certain things um, for sure. But I just wanted to do this for you all as well as anybody who happens to be watching. Um, so just this has come up more recently as well, but I wanted to go over the math again for the um, the districts we're talking about, urban residential A, B, and C for modifications. Um, the, um, let me see if I have the pointer here, it's on, okay. Um, there's a, this area in um, green up here is, is Leeds, that's urban r residential A. We have also urban residential A um, off of the Ryan Road area, little pockets here. Um, for the most part, um, uh, we've, uh, we've got a little bit of, um, Urban Residential A around Childs Park and a little bit um, south of Jackson Street School, I guess. There's a little bit north of Florence Center and then a little bit off of Ward Avenue and around the uh, Round Hill, uh, I'm sorry, not Round Hill, but um, um, Crescent Hillside area. Um, Urban Residential A is in every district except for, or every ward, I should say, except for uh, Ward 4. Uh, the yellow area is urban residential B, uh, going sort of coming in towards town. This is Florence, uh, Florence Center right here, surrounded by the yellow urban residential B, and it flows all the way towards um, downtown Northampton. It goes out Bridge Street and South Street, and then um, urban residential C is really the core, the the ring around the central business district for the most part, and then where we've got some higher density um, apartment complexes and condominiums um, out River Run, um, Hampshire uh, Heights, and um, Hamden um, Gardens here was recently rezoned to urban residential C, actually. So that's the map, and there are bits of a um, urban residential um, B and C in every ward except for six and seven, um, and I guess five too, I should say. But um, this, as you can see, um, touches all the wards in the city. Carol, yeah. could you just show me again um, Ward 6 on the URA? Sure. There's, um, this is uh, Route 66, so um, around, um, I guess that's Wood Circle. I'm sorry, I forgot the names. Right around here. Um, and then north of um, Ryan Road. It's not actually on a street. The reason why it looks funny here is that most of this is water supply protection and it all used to be an overlay district on top of urban residential A, but when we converted water supply protection to just a baseline district, the leftover that was not in that resource area were these little pockets. So that's why it doesn't have a uniform shape. Where is it on Route 66? Um, 
David, can you tell exactly what streets those are? I think that's where Woods. Oh, um, Drive and, and maybe Bayberry and in through there. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. Um, okay, so moving along here. The goals of the zoning are really to match what, how the neighborhoods were built out. Uh, right now there's a great disparity in what would be allowed based on lot size. The minimum lot size is much larger than the way these neighborhoods were actually um, developed, which means there are a lot of non-conforming um, houses and it creates inflexibility for people who um, want to modify their structures. If they don't need a three family at a certain point in time and they want to collapse those to a single or two family, they could never go back to a three family because the zoning wouldn't allow that. Um, it also, an uh, um, ancillary effect of this is that um, if the zoning, if you all approve the zoning package that allows a little bit more flexibility in adding units here and there, um, it would enable folks to um, uh, reinvest in those older homes in a way that they might not be able to otherwise because uh, if they could add an apartment unit, let's say, to offset the cost of that um, financial burden to um, modify or upgrade their homes and bring them into um, better energy efficiency and just general maintenance, then um, this, this could help or th provide a means for, for folks to do that. Um, I'm not going to run through this whole list, but key components of the zoning change are um, generally to combine the table of uses and the, and the dimensional table. So you basically go to one location where in your neighborhood to find out what's allowed. You can find out most of what you need to know in one table. And we've been doing this gradually throughout the zoning changes and packages that you've seen in front of you is, is creating one table for each district. So it simplifies the zoning ordinance. Uh, it also creates one dimensional standard for any type of use. So if you have a single family versus a two family, as opposed to having various height requirements and setbacks and things depending on whether you have a single versus two or three family, which is the situation now. This also introduces, as we've discussed previously, design components that have not to this point been um, included in any of the zoning in the city. The only place we have design standards now are for the Central Business District and for the Elm Street Historic District, and those are based on historic design standards or historic um, preservation of historic elements of homes. Um, and the idea behind these design standards are really to, um, a as we allow greater flexibility and expansions of homes and maybe some new infill for um, um, units, the design standards address um, seek to address compatibility with the neighborhoods um, with, through parking lot locations, uh, the amount of pavement, setbacks, massing, and scale. And I'll go into some of those details because there have been a lot of questions about exactly how the design standards work and if they go far enough or not too far. Or too far. Um, we've also taken this opportunity to clarify the zoning and, and again like I said try to make it simpler so that everyone really understands what what's allowed in their neighborhood the idea is really to encourage sustainability by um, creating um, equity across the board allowing for various <laughs> and encouraging various types of housing so we're not clustering one type of housing in a certain part of town um, but we're um, a allowed to and enabled to spread those units across various neighborhoods the way that historically the neighborhoods had been constructed. You um, can probably think of various examples of 1920s um, apartment um, buildings that are right next to single family homes um, in some of these neighborhoods and they fit in, they're, they're part of the fabric of the neighborhood, but that's just not allowed um, anymore. Um, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to address and clarify public comments specifically on um, what the lot dimension requirements are versus what you can really do on a parcel and what um, the dimensional standards really translate to and talk a little bit about the benefits and concerns raised about people um, assuming that the goal is to address or help developers in particular as opposed to help helping residents citywide and just looking at it more of a as a um, sustain it from a sustainability perspective and issues about assessments and how it would affect people's property values has come up 
So I want to clarify and talk a little bit about that and certainly answer any questions that I can. Um, I'm not, obviously, don't do any of the assessments, so I'm just going to give it to you from a land use perspective and not go into details about how assessments are done. Um, and then I'll go into the specifics about design standards and a little bit about parking calculations. Uh, in terms of lot dimensions, um, in urban residential, uh, the, the lots, the minimum lot size requirement is proposed to be changed. And, and we, the way we, the way the package is, the reason for the numbers in front of you um, is due to an analysis of what's on the ground and how many, what large percentage of homes in each of these districts um, were non-conforming. And in many cases, 60% um, of single-family homes throughout A, B, and C didn't comply with the current zoning. And um, the percentages were higher for two, three, and multi-family um, structures. So we have upwards of 97% of non-compliance for a lot of the two- and three-family homes throughout the city. So um, the number, the, lot, the minimum lot size requirement, though, it's um, the number is reduced from, in some cases, one unit per 6,000 square feet down to one unit per 2,500 square feet. That number sounds like a big jump, but in reality, it's bringing up all of those nonconformities, not to 100 percent, but close to 100 percent compliance. So we didn't pull a number out of the hat. We really tried to look at what was on the ground to, to match that with the, with the proposed zoning. And there are lots of factors in determining, you know, just because you have a large enough lot size by mathematical, um, you know, equation looking at how many <coughs> units you could put on the ground, it doesn't mean that you could actually build those. So if I go from a 10, if I have a 10,000 square foot lot and I could only have a single family house, that doesn't necessarily mean that if the zoning changes I can put four units on my property because there are issues about wetlands or steep slopes potentially or, um, open space calculations and even design standards. You might not be able to accommodate all the parking you need for that use. Um, so you can't just look at a parcel and say this whole neighborhood is going to turn into, you know, going to double in, in unit count um, based on the zoning because there's so many other factors that go into making that determination. Um, and in terms of the benefits, um, as I mentioned previously, the idea wasn't to um, try to open the floodgates for a particular um, segment of the um, population. We really looked at, we have, we know we have housing and affordability gaps. We've had a housing plan that was done, completed a couple of years ago, and I believe, Councillor Schwartz, you were um, very much involved in, in the issues of housing and affordability. And, and we've done a really good job in the city of providing subsidized housing at the very low income level. And the market is very good about taking care of the very high end housing and meeting the needs of people who want large um, homes that are more, some people might consider luxuries. Um, and the market really isn't addressing those um, needs in the middle, um, what we refer to as anywhere for people who are me, uh, making 100 to 120 percent of the area median income. So people who are working, they work in Northampton, but they can't afford to live in Northampton, so they're commuting from other, um, other towns in the surrounding areas just to come to work in the banks or um, to the grocery stores or wherever, downtown in the shops where we all shop. Um, and so we have employment needs, um, employees who need housing here, and that has an impact too. If people are driving in from elsewhere to work here, that has impacts on our roads. Um, we also know that there are people who are looking for housing. They want to age in place. They have stayed in a neighborhood for you know, two decades, and they're looking around. They want a smaller place. They want to be on one, a single floor. but. The only places that are being built are brand new construction, which is very expensive, and they can't afford to do that. And so if they could modify their existing structure so that they could stay there, then um, they would do that. Um, we also know that not everyone has the wherewithal to do this on their own. So homeowners might need a partner to help, you know, 
pull this all together or maybe there's no interest in the current homeowner to build and it, nothing might happen for many years until the property is sold and then people who have the expertise like the builders and the contractors in our community can come in and make those modifications and provide housing um, to address um, the needs of the people who are here and also who are moving here. Um, in terms of assessments, there's a concern that, you know, the zoning might all of a sudden increase people's property values across the board um, and then they be assessed at a, at a different rate because they could now add one or two units to their properties. Um, assessments are still going to be done as they've always been done, which is based on comparables from other um, properties around that are, that are like their own properties. And, and assessments aren't done as, as future projected value. That's only done if you have a raw piece of property and there's no development on it and then the assessors are going to look at all the potential um, build out options. But typically people have to make a proactive, um, take a proactive stance that then would generate a reassessment and, and a reevaluation of what can be done on that property. So if the zoning changed and someone decided, well, now that the zoning's changed, I can create a new lot um, next to my house. Um, once a person submits a survey to, in fact, divide that property, that's the trigger for the assessment or reassessment or reevaluation to happen. Um, it doesn't happen necessarily in a, in a vacuum without that. So. Um, thank you for answering that because I did have concerns about that. Hearing off and on that your property could be assessed because of that zoning change. And I questioned how can you actually do an assessment without doing that complete survey, coming to planning and making it a lot? Right. That's when it should be assessed. Right. And that, that's when it is. Right. So, and you often see that once we get the surveys in, the assessors get a copy of that and they say, okay, here's a new building lot. Someone has just created a new building lot. And um, as another example, right now, every single family house in Northampton has the ability or the, we, the regulations allow them to add a, what we call an accessory apartment. The assessors don't distinguish between an accessory apartment versus a two-family, but they also don't assess every single family house as though it were a two-family. They only assess it as a two-family once someone takes out a building permit to create an accessory apartment. Yeah. But the assessors have to do what is dictated by the Department of Revenue. Right. Like, and they do that every year. And the Department of my conversation with the Department of Revenue last week is that they expect the assessor to assess the property at the highest valued use of the land. So whether it's subdivided or not, there will be, by the Department of Revenue, there will be tax consequences. If, you, if, it's, if it's the zoning will allow for another lot, the Department of Revenue will catch up with the city of Northampton and there will be tax consequences. That's right from the assessor in the Department of Revenue. There would be um, potential for having potentially extra land that, that but if you have a single family, I mean, there are examples now I can, um, of, of properties where you could divide and create a separate single family house lot, but it's assessed as a single family house because that's the use on the ground. So it, um, you know, I, I don't know the, the distinction between, you know, excess land that has potential versus building a lot, but I believe that there are gradations in that. So I wouldn't, you know, I can't tell you otherwise. You've got some information from the, assess, from the state. Um, but at the same time, I, I believe, it's my understanding that there is a different, there's, there are gradations, so it's not necessarily that you have a buildable lot, and there's so much that goes into making that determination. And my conversation with the assessors was they can't just wholesale go out and say, okay, now that we see that you have a little bit more than, you know, two frontage, um, the ability to create a second um, building lot, 
doesn't mean that you can. There may be, they might be right next to a stream and could never build it. So there's no way they could assess it as a building lot if it were um, abuts a stream. So there, there would be potentially further investigation by the assessors, but I don't think they could open the map and, and compute um, automatically an assessment that every lot is now eligible for subdivision. Well, I understand that about wetlands or brooks or whatever is covered that is not buildable land. I don't think the Department of Revenue is going to force the assessor to tax you on a piece of useless property as a building lot. But I do think, and history shows that the state is looking for any way it can to collect a little bit more money, that they will scrutinize this. I think if I had an extra building lot aside of my house, I am sure that it might not be this year, but maybe it might be the year after. But somebody will eventually catch up with us from the state, and I think there will be tax consequences. Okay, um, just to clarify, I heard you say that there are a number of examples in the city presently of folks who have more than just, the, the basically have a bill, what would be considered by right, presently, a buildable lot, yet um, they're assessed as just the single family house on the one lot presently and have been for decades or however long that they've, mm -hmm. right. that's been the case. Right. Right. So if we were to project future practice based on present practice, it would make sense that if that trigger you said is the taking out of permits and doing things, that that would, act, if that, you know, if we were to, figure that what would go on in the future is what's happening right now, then it would make sense that should the zoning pass and people find themselves next to a buildable lot when they weren't previously, um, that would not automatically uh, be an increased assessment. That's what it sounds like. That's my understanding. Okay. Thanks. Um, and so uh, just to briefly go over the, um, the design guidelines, um, there's been a lot of discussion and e leading up to that, and I think I, I mentioned at um, one of the previous um, hearings that there was a lot of discussion about whether we were going too far in this first sort of entry into design standards for, for single, two, three family homes. And um, so th this is really seeking to, uh, create a balance and address the concerns, but not go into detailed architectural standards um, across the board. So the first criteria is really about um, um, in-town neighborhoods and creating attached garages and minimizing sort of the impact of an attached garage for structures. So um, you're allowed to, uh, attached garages can be closer to property lines currently, and that, that would remain the same, but you're, um, uh, there's a standard proposed that um, the facade of the garage um, can't be more than 30 percent of the total facade of the structure and the idea is that in these older neighborhoods we usually see detached um, garages and they're really they're really our accessory structures they're not meant to be the the face that you see along the street so that's the purpose of that standard um, the next one is really about uh, is about front doors and again the streetscape um, and ensuring that there are covered entries and doors uh, facing the street. Um, and then to get at some of the concerns that you've heard in public hearing uh, about extensions of units that might go to the rear of a property that then could have um, other effects into backyards of abutting parcels and it's similar to issues where you have now where you have corner lots and one person facing one side of the street their backyard faces the other backyards or side yards face backyards but there's another standard that was added through the public hearing process to address this concern and it is um, that uh, for those units where doors face the side yards of that particular parcel then you've got, um, when you have that situation, a front door, door is facing someone else's backyard on this abutting parcel in this example. So an additional buffer is required, uh, additional setback. So instead of a standard 15-foot setback, these units have to be 
a 20 foot setback if the entries face um, the yards of an abutting parcel. Um, and that's to create privacy um, and create that, uh, uh, maintain that sense of privacy for people's um, backyards. And, and um, that can be done through um, screening or fencing or setback. And again, that's a planning board review. Th these and the subsequent <coughs> standards um, can also be modified through planning board approval. So this is sort of the baseline standard. If someone wants to do something different than what's in the standard, they would need a special approval from the planning board. This, this, um, is, Council Freeman, this is intended for all URs? Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Um, I think just probably just by mistake or something, it was left out of the URC um, thing we have in our packets today. Yeah. So maybe it's just by the next reading or something, we can have it back in there because I, I know it's intended for all of them I just don't think it is in the okay uh, I thought for sure it was but we'll the, make sure the language is in is but the pictures aren't so oh it might have the, the pagination may have screwed up yeah. but yeah okay I'll make sure it's in there. Those, are, those are those are narrow lots you're talking about is that um it's any size lot so if there if for so f it doesn't uh, you know if you have the minimum frontage of 50 feet or and width of 50 feet or if you have 100 feet you need to have additional at least 20 feet of side setback um, instead of the standard 15 feet. Oh, just Moving you closer sure. to the back, so the, well, it would be the side line or the no, rear, line, it, rear lot line in that case. Well, potentially, or um, going up, there are many ways you could address that. The idea, whoops, sorry. Um, the idea is really to, so here's a door facing <coughs> the rear yard, potentially, of a, a house here. Um, Instead of a standard 15-foot setback to the side lot line, you would have a 20-foot side setback to give more space. Okay. Thank you. And, and just to clarify, in that, in that same image, for example, the middle image, if that were a 50-foot lot mm -hmm. and you were required to have 20 feet from either side, that's only a 10-foot wide structure then in the middle. Right. So you might not be able to do it in that scenario. Yeah. You, that, right. And that's another, that goes back to the issue that just because the uh, zoning allows you to do something doesn't mean that you can, right. that you have to meet the design standards, you have to meet the open space requirements. And if you can't, then maybe you are only going to have a single family house. Right. So, so these are, this is not a street. This is, these are individual pictures that we're supposed to look at individually. These are, whoops, sorry. These are, yeah, three different representations. So this is a situation where you've got um, a front, uh, this is the street so this is the front unit with the door facing the street that has covered entry then this is unit two unit three but they're facing this way in this scenario um, you have both units are facing the street so you used to have your standard 15 foot setback because this front entry for unit two is facing the street not the side lot line okay. council labarge did you have a question no what if you don't have sidewalks um, I mean, out in our area, we don't have any sidewalks except for new developments. Right. Well, and the, again, this is for the urban core neighborhoods. So oh. this wouldn't affect, um, the only thing would affect with those two little bits that I showed you on the map. Okay. Um, and, and then, if again, if you couldn't meet that standard, the, you know, you would go to the planning board. But your, for your neighborhood, it's really those two little okay. blips on the map. Thank you. Um, and then the, the third standard is about massing and ensuring that new structures really do fit into the face, the block face of the, of the neighborhood. Um, and then standard four is about breaking up parking lots. And there, has, there was a lot of discussion about some of the projects that have been approved in the um, previous years. We didn't have design standards or requirements that um, people look at the way parking relates to uh, the rest of the neighborhood as well as to the structure you're building. So this was to create, um, ensure that you're not creating big parking pads in front of apartment complexes, complexes let's say, and that it's really is more of a, uh, a small scale residential type of um, arrangement for the parking so that the parking piece is really minimized and and what's important here are the structures and how the structures relate to the street and the rest of the neighborhood um, there's also another standard that was added through this um, public hearing process as this has moved forward um, since its introduction and that was that um, 
driveways that access um, new pro projects that are wider than 15 feet have to be visually buffered from the abutting parcel. So if uh, we have a maximum 15 foot wide curb cuts, but you can widen out onto your property once you um, get off the street. And if you're to do that, um, your, your driveway really has to be screened from the abutting parcel again to get at um, minimizing the impact of impervious and pavement um, on the neighborhood and the streetscape. So is there, this is a maximum of two spaces required per unit. I hate to even say this, but is there a minimum? Um, um, no, more, this is the, it's not a maximum. It's no more, the, the city's not gonna require you to provide more than two per unit. So if you wanted to put three in for per unit, three parking spaces per unit, you could, but the city's not telling that you have to. And the minimum is one space per thousand square feet of gross living area, um, which basically simplifies the way we do it now. We have three different standards for parking now. And so this um, sort of takes the, the cleanest path to that and, and there's no more rounding anymore right now you have to you know if you're one and a half spaces then you round up and you have to go to two if you're just under one and a half you only provide one parking space so all of that goes away you just have one per thousand square feet and if you have 1100 square feet of house then you have to do two parking spaces if you have 900 it's one that's what I was getting at because I knew we had a space and a half right yeah okay <laughs> Um, so those are the um, design standards um, and oh, I just went over the parking yeah <laughs> um, so um, let's see um, so I'll just l go over the list of changes since this has gone in just to um, um, reiterate that there's been a special permit criteria that we've never had before for the creation of seven or more um, townhouse units or multifamily in urban residential C. Um, a special permit for the provision of seven or more townhouses in urban residential B. They, these are all um, added through this process. Um, there were some minor modifications to um, clarify the attached garage standards and when site plan standards are triggered. These are all in your packet as redlined, but I just wanted to highlight them on the screen. Um, and then I went over the new design standards and buffer standards that we just talked about in terms of driveways and um, backyard or, or doors facing backyards. Um, and then um, the most recent one came out of ordinance committee this week, which was a special, uh, an additional design um, criteria added to the special permits for um, projects that create 10 or more units and so what this would do is um, so there's a standard anytime you're going to build more than seven units in in urban residential B or C uh, that triggers special permit so you have the general design standards and a special permit criteria for seven to ten units. If you're building ten or more units, then there's another set of design standards for, for those types of projects. And those relate to ensuring that those would be consistent with what we require in the subdivision regulations relative to um, um, long um, streets or driveways materials and construction standards that we hold up for people who are going through the subdivision process. This isn't saying that these would be streets, but it's saying that your sidewalks have to be a certain depth, the same that we would require for streets, and that your curbing has to be granite curbing because it holds up better. And even though it's not a public street, it's just an urban, it's a benefit for an urban neighborhood to have sturdy infrastructure. Um, so those are the standards that were that are in your packet, and that was the most recent one. Carolyn, may I ask you, um, why was the number seven picked versus I feel comfortable like with five plus, and I'm seeing seven plus. Where did that figure come from? 
Well, there was a lot of discussion about that. We don't, we don't have, or at this point, we don't have a special permit criteria for any number of units in the urban residential C area. So it's all by site plan approval currently. Um, and the idea, and special permit becomes um, a little bit of a, a hesitation and potentially an impediment for construction. And um, so I think it's important, it certainly was important from a staff perspective that we understood that there were concerns from people in the neighborhood about big projects. But five units we don't feel is that big of a project. There are many homes now that have, um, that, um, have four to five units that um, you know, still function as a large home that aren't these massive developments and that they also provide, potentially you could create smaller units within a structure, but more of them, and we know that we, there's demand for smaller units. We don't have big you know, three bedroom, four bedroom apartments that are being constructed. But going back to the original question, special permit really does create sort of um, an impediment. And in fact, we think that even at seven, there's potential for people to get a workaround by parsing out their project and saying, okay, today I'm going to apply for seven, tomorrow I'm going to apply for seven more, but it's really all the same project, but we're not, we can't look at it as a master plan development. So we want to also prevent that kind of thing from happening to the extent possible. And the lower the number, the more likely that we're not going to be able to look at these projects in, you know, as a master plan and people will figure out a way to come in bits at a time. Um, and we think that seven is, you know, um, I think in these areas, particularly around downtown with walking distance of downtown, is where we um, want to be able to provide flexibility for units. So. Thank you. Are you done with your presentation? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Um, I uh, I look up here and see a lot of these uh, changes, and I have to again thank the planning department um, for working with me because uh, most of those came from me. <laughs> so uh, so thank you, and um, I have one more that uh, has been passed out on your desk. That was that the. Um, the OPD helped me with in the last couple of days. Uh, and it's really to reflect the, um, the difficulty that I think uh, at least I'm having, many of my residents have, are having and many of the people who spoke today are having regarding, um, regarding really only about 10% about or, or less of the t entire zoning package. And that's the, the fact of these, of this, of the specter I think of larger projects um, uh, breaking the the normal expectations of, of, the, of this package uh, on, on lots that uh, should that um, for whatever reason haven't been developed uh, but now could be and could be uh, to quite significantly uh, and that's not to say that uh, I'm against a larger or larger scale development but uh, I do think that it needs a little bit more time and a little more study but I don't I, I think the time has come to pass what I what I believe that there's a lot of consensus around and, um, and I think that's for uh, liberalizing the zoning for most smaller projects and um, I want to commend Councillor Adams who who um, who wanted these larger projects to look to have a lot of the provisions of subdivision but I think that again it's just it's it's just not there yet and and speaking with um, the office of planning and development over the last few days uh, I was informed that the planning board does have it at the near the top of its list to develop uh, regulations for urban uh, urban um, master planning uh, or urban um, urban uh, large urban projects or larger urban projects so um, my uh, my suggestion is that we, we pass this uh, tonight, uh, but we um, we uh, give a, a moratorium on um, projects with seven or more units and ask the planning board to come back with um, a more specific uh, more specific standards and more specific outline about how 
these larger projects will proceed. Because I, I'm not even sure the planning board was going to appreciate the special permit process for these projects uh, without greater clarity around uh, why they're going through the hearings and so on. Um, and I think that, that uh, this nine-month moratorium will be very valuable for, uh, for the community, for the council, and, and, uh, and for planning. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. I think that uh, I really appreciate being able to move this forward. And though I probably would have supported the whole thing without this, I think for the sake of getting the community behind it and also the fact that I agree with you, I think that about 90% of this, there is cons consensus. And so it seems to me that this would be a reasonable approach. I do have one question whether we can actually do that um, in terms of our own process. I believe we can, but there are some questions about that. I think we need to address those in terms of what happens if, because we are not voting anything down here. What we were, so I, so I think we can do it, but I know this question is going to come up, well, so. What, what I would consider, this is the first group. Okay. In the interim, we can have the city solicitor review and see. Thank you. Good, good the suggestion. The concern, of course, is to abide by state zoning law and process and, I, and I, we certainly don't want to gum up everything based on um, our, our, our sense of urgency on this particular issue. So um, should that be the case, should this survive, um, then uh, I've asked the mayor to refer this to the city solicitor until and he's meeting with him tomorrow and hopefully we'll get an opinion before the next council meeting. Okay, so, thank you. Second. I do support this. So I propose that amendment. I think it might be a second. Uh, that is a second. Okay. As, as uh, Councilor Specter's qualified second. <laughs> uh, all right. This is on the uh, the amendment that has been advanced. I'm sorry, that's it right here. Right. The amendment that Councilor Freeman Daniels has here. Uh, any discussion on that popped up? Yeah. How many besides? Planning board meetings and things such as that in the zoning meetings. Full, like a forum or a public forum has been. On these? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well. Uh, the, re uh, the reason that I, uh, I ask yeah. is about 20% of the people that I ask support this and 20% don't. And the other 60% haven't heard a damn thing about it. So <laughs> that's the reason why I ask. Um, I know there's been plenty, so I would like somebody to say that there's been plenty of public. There's been yeah. plenty of public. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. So what we did, so. But that's the norm. It's not no, something it It's the norm. Uh, no, I, I would attention. say we've done actually far more public forums um, for the, this package than any other zoning ordinance change we've done. We did a ton of public forums for chickens. <laughs> we did a ton for, you know, some of the business district changes, but this is two or three tons, I guess, if I were to compare. And, and to be more specific, um, this is going back, we're in 2013. Um, we started the forums, a, um, the official forums, we had four or five last fall. Um, through the winter, I guess. But before that, leading into that, there were a lot. There was lots of public discussion and outreach, as the planning board was developing the um, ordinances more than what had been developed leading up to that piece, which was the two-year, two and a half year, not all on um, zoning changes for residential. But the zoning revisions committee looked at this for two and a half years, had forums on that. So it's a very different process than many of the other zoning packages that you see in front of you. Because I got a load of 11th hour naysayers and, um, and I try to say, well, look at where were you for the last year? <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you very much. Council Specter. No? Uh, this is on, again on the amendment, please. Uh, discussion on the amendment. Um, David's got to say. David. David. Oh, Council Murphy over here oh. <laughs> in my periphery. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support it in first reading with the understanding that it may end up having to go off because it makes it a little more restrictive. It may have to go off through even more process and mm -hmm. public hearings before we can officially add it. I mean, and I'll support it tonight to 
but it I'm concerned it probably has got a longer road and just to clarify I think the way that um, the way that the ordinance in front of you is is drafted is with the intention that it did need additional hearing but that you could pass the ordinance is forward and refer this one out right away and there's language in there sort of tying the moratorium to the other package mm -hmm. so that if it was indeed determined that we had to do separate um, mm -hmm. public hearing with ordinance and planning board it could do that and it could come right back so Council Tate and I'd like to ask Councillor Murphy his expertise in the assessor's office and things such as that how do you could read that could, could we address is that uh, could, I'm, relevant I'm to the amendment relevant well, let's to the we have amendment. Right. we have to do the amendment first and yeah. speak to that and Councilor Freeman Daniels to the amendment. do you want us to also re uh, refer this after if if this amendment survives to us want us also to refer it to ordinance and planning well I guess we'll wait to hear back from the city solicitor to okay. see if yeah. that's necessary and hmm. um, so if you do that on second reading um, okay yeah, yeah. this is on the amendment uh this would require a roll call or should we do no this wouldn't this is an amendment we can do this by voice vote is everyone comfortable with the voice vote all those in favor please aye. say aye. aye aye any opposed any abstentions okay so the amendment passes now back to the work at hand councilor adams can you speak to the concerns of ms lefko about unintended unintended consequences of the zoning um well, I think the, the issue is a concern about um, large-scale projects coming into neighborhoods. And I think, um, I think that um, there may be, there are, I think part of this package is um, that the goal, one of the goals is to create uh, more opportunities for housing development. Um, I don't know that there's a market for large apartment buildings in the city of Northampton the other thing that this does is allow smaller single-family homes to be built which we know that there's demand for smaller in town single-family homes so I think that um, you know this in any given neighborhood there could be a change because a change means a new structure or a modification of existing structure and um, but at the same time the idea is to enable development in areas that are walkable and accessible to goods and services and schools and things like that and that's where these urban residential a b and c districts are we do have um, and the idea is to spread that out and to allow that in various neighborhoods so that there's not undue pressure in one neighborhood versus another um, so i think this and i also believe that the design standards that are proposed um, are something we don't have on the books today and so would not um, so anything that we that people may have seen up to this point that they are concerned about I think would be addressed in the design standards that are proposed and the idea was to ensure as we grow and allow new types of um, housing in our neighborhoods that they do meet a different standard than what is currently allowed so I don't know if that answers your question but I think that um, the whole idea is not to um, focus development in one single block or one neighborhood but really to allow things to happen throughout the city and I think that's typically what we've seen in Northampton is more of a slow um, development here and there of, of units and, and I would foresee that hap continuing to happen I just want to say that um, I think I think we're at a point I support this at least on first reading I think we're at the, at the point where We've struck a good balance between greater allowed usage of property and I think we're close to adequate safeguards. And I'm also particularly happy about the possibility of creating um, more affordable units or at least more units of different levels of affordability. We've had many recent conversations about a lack of affordability, affordability in Northampton. And if this can do, um, if this can go some way to address some of that, I think that would be a, a, a very, very difficult to achieve. Thank you. Questions or discussion? Council. Just to uh, just to point out the uh, the couple of examples that came before us in public comment that um, 
this zoning would address, such as having to create that whatever it is, 40-foot hallway between two existing, I mean, between two s separate structures in order to comply with the current zoning. Um, obviously, if this addresses problems like that, that border on ridiculous, that um, that will be really helpful. And if at the same time um, we can address the issues, the concerns that people raised about you know, safeguards needed for um, larger scale construction, larger scale uh, unit construction, then um, I'll support this and the amendment. Anyone else? Uh, Councilor Freeman Dams. I just want to say again, uh, I really want to thank OPD for um, working with uh, the concerns of, of the entire Ward 3 neighborhoods, um, neighborhood and uh, Having we had a special uh, meeting with uh, with the department where they uh, laid out some specific examples of some, some specific streets and parcels, and it was very valuable. And uh, I think we we had some valuable um, feedback come out of that, and um, and uh, valuable actual changes to the law. Um, I think there's widespread agreement that uh, this is a, a good liberalization, and I think that the inclusion of design of these design standards will help the, uh, the the infill, which we're expecting and hoping for here. Uh, it will help it in many ways, and it, we won't get some of the uh, kind of uh, acrobatics, sort of, uh, sort of um, you know, architectural acrobatics that had to happen. Uh, and, and that was, I understand, as described, has not only is described as hypothetical, but actually does happen, uh, has happened in uh, with these with these standards. So. I'm ready to vote on this. The, um, I, I'd just like to say that actually, point in fact, I, I have witnessed several examples during my tenure previously and now of projects that have done these torturous accommodations or end runs in some cases uh, and resulting in projects that were hideous. Uh, they were object objectionable to the abutters, uh, ultimately objectionable to the people who resided in them and, and serve no purpose. The, the appeal of the zoning changes is essentially what we're doing is we're pu pulling on a pair of pants that fits now. That more as we've grown out of it and changed. The principal concerns that we heard were mostly from, uh, well, the two. One was uh, relative to the easement, I mean, relative to um, the assessment, which actually more came from the council floor than it came from, from the audience and from folks who were even calling, although that certainly triggered some people's concerns. Um, to that point, it's true. And what we're talking about is property values and the impact of property values. Usually, of course, the objection is the reduced property values, the setting up of the system that might be hideous or oversized that would adversely impact someone's property values. In that case, they're not thinking in terms as uh, a taxable asset. They're thinking that it simply as an asset. On the other hand, this will, in some cases, not a lot, but in some cases, increase someone's asset, something that someone owns, their value will be increased by these changes. Um, and arguably, that on one hand, that's a good thing. I understand that it's a, it's a dreadful thing if you're thinking that it's going to mean that you're going to have to pay more taxes, but you also have a greater asset. I, that's the thing that we have to reconcile here. The other, com the other concern was came almost exclusively from one neighborhood for very good reasons. And I think, and I commend Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Adams and OPD for working on this really hard and working with the, with the representatives of that community and, and Mr. Nash's contributions uh, from uh, originally on the ZRC and then, and then his advocacy further. And, I think what I'm hearing here is that everyone's principal concern is to move forward the bulk of this package as it does do what what we've heard the people who appeal for it for or are asking us to pass it. And I and I haven't heard much refutation of that issue, of the fact of creating um, 
and maintaining neighborhoods and affordability and making uh, particularly for middle class investment in the community and also for people who in my cohort are starting to age out and stairs are becoming more daunting and um, possibility of you know buying that Florida trailer doesn't seem quite as appealing as staying here in Northampton I think that I get the sense that the rest of the council considers this to be an appropriate move to move this package forward with the consideration of Council Freeman Daniel's moratorium that addresses specifically um, the Henry Street Montview Avenue neighborhood and uh, I and perhaps maybe we should get to that. Are there any objections to that, Councilor Murphy? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been around for far too many of the public hearings on this, I think. And we may be even sending one more piece back to do it yet again. But I mean, this, this document, the current zoning ordinance, has been around for almost 40 years. And for almost 20 of those 40 years, it hasn't really matched what our goal has been for the city. But it's like a, I'm going to use another clothing analogy. Okay. Like a, a pair of comfortable old shoes, they're falling apart, they're not working so well, but we're used to them, and we're going to have to break in a new set, so we're not going to be used to what's happening. I do not think this is perfect. There's some more things that it could use, um, and we still have to deal with the fact that it's going to take uh, the zoning board and the planning board some time to get used to enforcing what their parts of it would be because they're not used to doing that. But I think overwhelmingly we need to take this first step in this direction. So, yeah, there might be some tax unexpended consequences and places where we say, gee, we didn't think that would happen, but it did. But I think we need to, to take this first step and move forward. And we'll, uh, we can tweak it as we've tweaked it in the process. We can continue to tweak it. But I think it's so past due to take a step in this direction that we, we really need to move forward and, and uh, get it on the way. Councilor Bart. I'd like to make a motion so that we could go ahead and vote on this, please. You're calling the vote? Yes. yes. Questions Aye. being called. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Bart? Yes. yes. We already uh, did the, the amendment, I think. The, this yes. is the package as, we, as, as amended. amended. Yeah. Right. Councilor Bart? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Ford? Yes. Councilor Stafford? Yes. yes. Councilor Chase? Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Aye. This is the first reading. We'll find out the, uh, the disposition of the amendment. Uh, more on that, but it is past first reading. Do you want to do the rest of the ordinance? Yeah. Let's 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 now let's see. I think that almost will clear the room, except for the mayor. Where's the mayor? Oh, all right. Who was, <laughs> who, was, yeah. who was in charge of the mayor? The glenery stand <laughs> up. You don't know if he's coming back. Snuck up. All right. No, then no sense in rushing up his. Let's go back to the beginning of the council meeting. Remember licenses. Okay. <laughs> or licenses. Um, we do have more zoning. Uh, well, Carolyn, you take care. Let her. Yeah. Let's you want to take care of Carolyn? Here. Yeah. Please. Yeah, because we've got. We have more. no licensed applicants here, so Carolyn, when you want to talk about the Greenway and other such, uh, this uh, the first would be the financial order that moved with a recommendation uh, for the land adjacent to King Street. <coughs> that financial order. You got two more zoning ordinances. He's got dimensional central business. Oh yeah. I. <coughs> So, uh, which one do you want? To, which one what, are you going to do? Uh, what, what, six, what? Six and seven under order. Let's do six and seven under order. Yeah. Okay. Should be bad. Do you want to move these as a group? Yes. I'll please. move. Yes. I'll move them both as a group. Okay. Second. And a second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 So we're putting one. Six wait, and wait, seven. Wait, wait. Hey, I'm wait. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, we'll separate them out. This is upon the recommendation of the Planning Board and Ordinance and Ordinance of the City of Northampton providing the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts to be amended by revising Section three, uh, 350C, Attachment of said Code providing the allow residential uses on the first floor of Central Business District in areas not abutting a road 
and be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton, the City Council assembled as follows the Section 350C attachment of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended so that such section <coughs> shall read as follows. Um, any residential use above the first floor, and here's the change, any residential use located to the rear of otherwise permitted non-residential uses that are at least 20 feet deep and any residential use on a property which is not a butt on a public way maintained by the city. And then strike home office occupation. Move to is that group? And then with an <coughs> amended language to include also home businesses are considered residential uses for these purposes. Move to approve it. Move to approve move to amended? Uh, yep. Yeah, move to second. Second? Okay. Carolyn, you want to speak to this? Sure. Um, this um, would, up to this point, we haven't allowed any ground floor residential in the Central Business District to encourage um, street life viability and that kind of thing. We've had, we had a, um, we've had some conversation and we had a um, sort of a mini downtown charrette a couple <coughs> ago or so and sort of floated this idea with um, development community property owners um, about allowing residential um, units to be on the ground floor behind the street facade of commercial um, buildings and pretty much everyone who attended that um, a forum uh, really felt like it was important to maintain that streetscape for commercial viability on the first floor, but um, that they felt that it would be um, of great interest to have uh, more flexibility to residential units back behind and off street. So we're talking about places that might be have deep lots, like going out King Street where Wayland's Insurance and the Bank of America building are. They're deep. They go back to the railroad tracks. but. You could maybe potentially have a residential structure in the rear of that property, but commercial up on King Street or in some of these other um, <coughs> properties um, in the core area that um, have um, don't have street frontage. So it's really to create a little bit more flexibility for residential uses downtown. Councilor Tayson and Councilor Adams. <coughs> How is it that, uh, what is the, uh, the situation with the Florence Inn in the center of Florence on North Maple Street. Why does that have residents on the first floor? Um, because it's pre-existing non-conforming. No, uh, no, absolutely not. It was supposed to be commercial space on the first floor. Which structure are you talking about? I'm sorry. Florence Inn, North Maple Street, right across from the hardware store. It was right. developed as a service and that owns it. It's 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 used to have required. Is that central business? It's yes, it general is. General business. No, it's general business. General business. Same general standard business. applies in general business. Um, uh, I guess I'd have to make sure I understand which property it is. I can talk to you offline about that, but it is the general business district. Yeah. Okay. I'll. Uh, you, yeah, here. give me a call. Be in touch. It's back. <clears throat> I'm the mayor. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Council Adams, I'm sorry. Yes, you were next. If this were allowed and there there were hypothetically a, a, a development in the roundhouse lot, would this apply there? Yes. Um, not at street level, but so if in the back corner, for, for instance, you could potentially have a non-resident or a residential use, um, but we would want residential use along the public ways and along um, New South Street. Is that New South Street? Yeah. So, if there were an, if there were an entrance from the park into this hypothetical mixed-use building around, it, it, there could be residential in the back. What if there was? What if it was on the, on the ground floor too? If say say it extended from the top of the park down to the bottom. So coming from the park, um, that um, is um, that may. That would be a budding. Um, that'd be sort of. Well, that's a. That's a. Um, I think in that example, it's set back off the street. So potentially, as if it weren't on a public street, if you had at least 20 feet, if it were on a public street, you'd have 20 feet of depth of commercial, and then behind that, you could have residential. But if you're talking about dropping down from the park level down below, that could be residential potentially in the on the lower. So it could levels. go. It could go. Coffee shop, retail, apartment. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can support this based on that. Thank you. Is, Councilor, is there chalk in that, at that chalkboard? Because I'm, I'm, I'd like a sketch of what you're talking about here. I can't draw it, <laughs> but, but I mean, if, if there were if there were a, a, a development here, right in the park, and I'm talking about on the ground level, say it was it was it's it's mixed use. So I mean, under under our our zoning now, the first it would have to be all commercial right now. If this passed, you could have residential there as well. I, I don't I don't think that I don't think that makes sense. I think actually, we're, first of all, we're talking about an anomaly property here, and we're also talking property, oddly enough, that's actually a subject for review for uh, development. Uh, the city owns that lot, and I believe part of the criteria, at least historically, was to preserve the, the from the ground up one level for parking. But so that would eliminate that concern about uh, mixed use having a coffee shop and, and down in that. You're talking about the parking level lot the parking level uh, that uh, residential could be down there is your concern and right. and right. coffee shop and things like that as opposed to what it butts and faces the park right right and I think I don't know then we'll, we can get some clarification on that but um, I, at least originally back in the day when <laughs> uh, uh, when, when that was allotted for, or put up for uh, the hotel the one of the stipulations was to preserve the one of the critical stipulations to preserve existing parking uh, inventory can I, can I have a question about was, was parking mandated on that first level or could it have been somewhere else within it I believe it was but I, I mean, you're still you're still entitled to just the parking was, it was mandated by the by the order that it had to be replaced it didn't say oh, okay it so the inventory level, had to be said that there could be no net loss of parking so it didn't really okay. get into the specifics. But the it. reason that it was there was because the the you know the quality rooms <laughs> are from the park level and above, and so you'd always put your parking below that for that situation. And I think um, you know again, it's a um, um, the idea of having some non uh, you know at the park level. I think that's that's a good conversation to have, and given that it's a public. Uh, piece of property that's um, going to go through this um, design process essentially um, you know I think that would make sense for that um, at that level of that conversation but there's been a lot of discussion about given that that's sort of down below grade where most of the street activity is up here and it's tucked back in a parking lot that it may make sense if someone felt like they could ha make residential uh, make a go of it as residential it might be more viable than um, sticking a coffee shop way in the back corner of a parking lot where people aren't going to see it and be able to access it. Well, my hope is that it would become more vibrant and there would be maybe people going down there for other purposes, I mean, um, you know, shopping purposes. Mm -hmm. So, well, that you know. That would be part of an RFP that we would develop that, that the mayor wants to get to at some point. Uh, some, right. somebody. And this doesn't preclude commercial development. No, no, I understand that. I understand that. Allow I understand that. flexibility. No, I, I don't know that's a that's a tough place to try and use at the, as the litmus test for this ordinance because as I recall they only cleaned that up suitable for parking use anyway right you know they that wasn't meant to be the the, the yeah bottom. I don't think anybody's gonna be yeah. plunking residential properties at ground level on a parking lot that was contaminated to the point where it's only cleaned up enough to be a parking lot so that's true uh, when this when this came to Edlu, I was generally supportive, um, and I still am. Uh, but uh, if we're going to be talking about specific properties, then I'll, now I have my favorite <laughs> one. I want to ask about the uh, the one that was developed on on um, on uh, right next to Kathy's Diner, the uh, the award the winning Sisman project, property, the Sisman yeah, pro yeah. property. Right? Would that under this new rule would that have a would, would they have been able to put um, residential on uh, that abuts the bike path or would that have been considered a public way the bike path is not considered a public way so you and um, you know there's residential on that level now right. anyway the ground the street level is strong Avenue and that and that would continue to remain commercial although this would allow 
I don't know if you could get skinnier <laughs> commercial depth on that in that block, but potentially, actually, a better example no, is 96 Pleasant Street, that where the city put block grant money right across from the chamber building. The front of that building are those two small um, commercial, uh, um, and actually, the gut, right, right. Um, but behind that is residential. So that doesn't affect, I mean, the, that was for other reasons that became that way, but that's an example of how you might have a shallow um, street front commercial presence, but still allow residential behind it. And you don't really even know it, it keeps the vibrancy along the street. Just to follow up, so, so the bike path isn't a public way in right. that respect, in, or, or according to this, according to the understanding of this. What about, what about a park? I mean, is a park considered a public way as yeah. well? No, okay. I think the example that you used that was the best when we had our last public hearing on it was the structures behind um, the Wood Star. Yeah. Where a re right. there, there's one residential property back there, and when they originally <coughs> did it, the first floor had to be a studio or commercial. Right. They're building another one. In this instance, it would permit the first floor to be residential. Yes, correct? exactly. So that's probably a, a better example than yes. the other ones we've used right. of where it's off. A public way. And in fact, all those other buildings, the um, Alex Gieslin's building, you know, that he has office back there, the ground floor yeah. could be. But, but the yep. new one then could conceivably have residential on the ground floor. Right. And because of that example that uh, Council Murphy was kind of to point out, I'm going to have to recuse myself from voting and actually abstain because I work for mm -hmm. um, the Media Education Foundation where that. Um, the executive director is building that property out, so yes. don't want to appear, I don't want any conflict. Mm -hmm. So I will be abstaining and mm -hmm. explaining my abstention. Mm -hmm. Just want to set an example, uh, Councillor uh, Pacey. <coughs> I know. <don't see> <laughs> I, I just don't get the reason for why you wouldn't want commercial, and I guess I just don't get the reasoning. Why you wouldn't want commercial spaces exclusively on the first floors in a central business district? I just don't. I mean, um, whenever you go to different townships throughout states, like the Boston area, they have you know little alleys and they have things such as that, and there's shops back there, um, and it seems to be a draw. I don't. Uh, Again, this doesn't preclude commercial from happening. I think it's what the idea is that if um, that that resident residential units also add to um, you know help support the vibrancy of a downtown, and as long as you're not taking away from that pedestrian character on a public street, mm -hmm. the idea was to facilitate if if the market you know um, were to move in that direction. That, back portions of properties that might not be viable for a commercial space or a retail presence could then be viable for something else like residential and and you know we've got um she said. this building on actually at the end of cracker barra alley and one amber place it's its own address is the only place there and technically the ground floor has to be commercial but you know there's a residence in there and it's sort of a it's it's tucked away in the back. It's not an area that's going to be a draw necessarily for pedestrians. So the main street is really the, the facade that um, is important. And I guess the idea is that it just provides another level of flexibility for in encouraging more intensification downtown of, of uses. I think if I just, I still like the idea of promoting commercial space on first floor. <laughs> Well, hang on, Council Murphy and Council Freeman Daniels. Actually, uh, and then actually, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. either of these two guys have spoken. Well, might be just quick, as Carolyn mentioned, this does not procure, pro okay, we don't need to prohibit a property that's viable being used commercially. If, if that is its highest and best use and it supports a commercial use, you can do it. But if your feeling is it's so out of the way, no one's ever going to find it, and it makes more sense economically to turn it into a residential unit, you have the option, so it doesn't say you don't have exactly. to. Exactly. If you just can't rent that space out commercially because nobody can find it, mm -hmm. you can use it residentially. Okay. okay. Councillor Carney and Councillor Spire. Well, just to answer Councillor Tacey's um, concern or question, I think this just, the, it certainly does still require that anything facing, facing the street um, would be a commercial use. 
and it satisfies that, and that makes sense that we'd want things that people would see and the public would see right there in the front along the streetscape to be commercial use. But those places that are tucked in the back for which a commercial use, you know, could or could not be even accessible or seen by the general public, mm -hmm. it allows for the building of <coughs> or anyone else to have a different use. And it also satisfies some of the things that we heard about in public comment, which are, you know, a lack of um, residential space downtown. So it allows for an additional use, certainly without taking away from any of the um, uh, public, public way uh, commercial uses. I, I understand it doesn't prohibit, it, also, but it doesn't promote commercial space. It doesn't promote the commercial use. No, it doesn't promote it in the back. It, yeah. it says that you can put a commercial space in the back if you can find a commercial space to go there, but if you can't, you can still put in a residential space back there. Councilor Specter and Councilor Freeman Dan. Councilor Carney said it better than I could say it. Councilor Freeman Dan. I, uh, two things. I also um, concur with uh, Councilor Murphy and Carney regarding this. Uh, I do, I think actually, um, regarding Councilor Tacey's concerns, that uh, there is some element of promotion here as well, and it's small, but, um, you know, oftentimes, it, it, what we have now, uh, we're at a point in the market place where uh, residential is is a, a significant competitor to uh, commercial, and um, it may be that uh, a project gets shelved because um, of this requirement, um, or the project is uh, not as big, uh, or is um, or the finances might not work for it. So uh, I think that allowing for some residential use will uh, actually could could and, and probably will encourage some uh, commercial development downtown in the central business district uh, because residential uh, has been bid up uh, so much in the recent years uh, so I think that it will actually achieve what you're talking about what Councillor Tacey is talking about which is uh, the um, additional commercial uh, use the only thing that I I'm just again I just want to harp back on this just because Public, I just think public way is a little vague. Um, it, uh, the bike path is in public way. A park is in public way. Is a parking lot a public way? Like, if a, especially municipal parking lot? No. No. Okay, so it, it's pretty, <laughs> the reason why I mean that term is pretty um, standard throughout statute. So 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 it's, it's not. It, it, you know, there, there there really wouldn't be any confusion about. So it's just. What, so is it? It's just sidewalks and streets. Is yes. that the idea? Any other questions? Just no, sorry. my last point is that I, I'm, I'm going to vote no on this. I think that, you know, I, 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 well, I understand completely that um, there's still an opportunity to have commercial spaces in, in these spots. Um, if, if, we, if it stayed the way it was and it, and, and it was mandated that there must be commercial on the first floor, if, if, um, if the owner of a, of a building had a difficulty renting out a space, they would have to lower the cost of it. Or leave it vacant, and I think that would give an opportunity for a business to who may not otherwise be able to be in this city to be in this city, and and um, I just I just I I was skeptical at it ordinance, but I voted yes. But now I'm just I'm just not persuaded. This is this is a this is the best way to go. So I'm voting no. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Schwartz. Yes. Yes. No. Nay. Yes. Aye. Yes. Six. Yes. Six is that Council Murphy? Can you, um, since we're talking to the solicitor about things that we've changed, could we run this by him too, just to make sure we didn't have to, because this got the language gets switched around on it just to make sure it doesn't have to go somewhere else yes yeah, good before point. second reading uh, we the language we pa we passed it like this at Edlu but I guess it just made when it came to ordinance it just didn't it have different. that that second that last sentence in there okay um, so but just to be sure that we don't and I'll, that language as well just so you know is 
it's just clarification of what the practice mm -hmm. has been. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not really a significant change from the way that we've been evaluating. It's rather f find out now than later <laughs> between readings. <sighs> okay. Okay. Let's see. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the planning board. This is an ordinance. Uh, an ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the code of ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, to be amended by revising section 350, 350A, ex, uh, sequential of said code, providing that increased height limits in general business district be ordained by the city council of the city of Northampton, the city assemble, city council assembled as follows: that section 350 to 350A, et sec, et whatever of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts to be amended so that the section, such section shall read as follows. Reasons for general business uh, changes. One, many uh, modern office or office commercial building require more height per floor than older buildings in order to accommodate air handling and mechanical. Two, support sustainable Northampton's goals for encouraging development in urban core areas. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the change is the change the maximum height in general business from uh, 50 to 60 feet. That's kind of the more salient point here. Um, uh, three, complement recent efforts to increase heights in central business, office, industrial, and general industrial to 70 feet, 45 feet, and 45 feet, respectively. Uh, allow a height limit that is visually compatible with the district. Accept a motion to put this on the floor. Second. Second by Council of Barnes, second by Council Murphy. You read it all. <laughs> I read it all? Yeah. That's all there is. Um, any questions? Confusions? Everyone's okay with this one? Yeah. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Yes. <laughs> she got off easy on that. She got off easy. Yeah, that's okay. So we'll get her on. <laughs> we'll get her on the greenway. Um, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> all right. Let's see. Where are we? For poor Mary, uh, we're at licenses, I believe. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Let's do the three for the mayor. <laughs> Your, you have your daughter locked in the back or something? Yes. Oh, shame on him. <laughs> what are the three for the mayor? Uh, street food. Uh, the food uh, 23, 24. Yeah. Okay. 22, 23. All right, 22, 23, and 24. Thank you. Right, uh, can we, do you mind if we ask the mayor which um, orders or ordinance are specifically interested in? Um, some questions about food cards. Yeah, yeah. Right, the appointments yeah. for the roundhouse. And he's. Enforcements, yeah. All right, shall we do these in order? Yeah, so you got one. Okay. On the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, this is an ordinance, an ordinance of the city of Northampton providing the code of ordinances be amended by revising 40-5 of said code providing list of enforcing officers and penalties for non-criminal disposition be it ordained by the city council of the city of northampton the city council assembled as follows it's section 40-5 of the code of ordinances of the city of northampton massachusetts be amended that so that such sections shall read as follows uh list of enforcing officers and penalties for non-criminal disposition amended as follows c uh, chapter 25-4C, enforcing officer with police, and the first offense is $50, second offense is $100, third offense is $250. Accept a motion to move this. Move to well, actually, I'd like to move 23, 24, 25 as a group, since Put the first together. two are enforcement officers right. for the last For the last. It doesn't two. make yes. any sense unless yeah. they all go together. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Motion is to move them as Second. a group. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, I did that backwards, actually, apparently. So, it's, uh, yes. um, so actually, up, let's have the mayor speak to the first one. And, and actually, if you'll bear with me, mayor, that's. Uh, what's the pleasure as far as the. Um, 
is the meat of the ordinance here, which give, lays out the mobile food vehicle regulations and standards. Yeah. Councilor Freeman Daniel. I, I hate to do this to you, but I do um, think you should read it. <laughs> I actually don't disagree, and I'm sorry. But uh, just upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, is an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising sections 285-4 of said code providing that mobile food vehicles be ordained by the city of council, blah, blah, blah. The mobile food vehicles amend as follows. Add subsection C. One, license and permits required. No person or entity shall operate a mobile food vehicle on any street or other public property without a mobile food vehicle permit issued by the Northampton Police Department. Any person seeking such permit shall submit an application for a mobile food vehicle to the Northampton Police Department along with the following. A, a state hawkers and peddlers license. B, form MT-1, meals and all beverage sales tax registration certificate. C, Northampton Health Department mobile food permit. D, proof of comprehensive liability insurance and workers' compensation insurance with the coverage limits as determined by the police department. C, Fire Department inspection for compliance with commercial cooking regulations, e. fire suppression system, bent hood, and fire extinguishers. That should be E, I think. What's that? That should be E, I think, or else we have two Cs. Maybe, yeah, good point. That's E. Uh, Scribner's error. Good catch. Thank you. Uh, mobile food vehicle permits are not uh, uh, transferable. Definitions. Mobile food vehicle. A food establishment that's located upon a vehicle or which is pulled by a vehicle where food or beverage is cooked, prepared, or served for individual portion service such as mobile food kitchen. Sidewalks. Such, <laughs> such parts of the highway, whether public or private, as are within the curbstones thereof in all places where curbstones are set. And also such parts of such highway has been established or used as a footwalk or sidewalk and also such parts of any streets or highway as shall be established or used and determined as footwalks or sidewalks. Street or highway, the entire width between the property lines of every way open to the use of public, of the public for purposes of travel, includes alleys, lanes, courts, public squares, public places, and it shall also be understood as including the sidewalks unless otherwise expressed. Three, the feed schedule. Mobile food vehicle application fee from the police department will be $50. Mobile food uh, vehicle permit from the police department will be $250 if the application is approved. State hawkers and peddlers license, $62 paid to the state. Uh, and there's a URL here. Uh, Northampton Health Department mobile food permit, $100 annually. And the mobile uh, food vehicle permit is not transferable. Once again, just to be sure. Location of the mobile food vehicles. That's number four. Uh, A, mobile food vehicles are not permitted to operate in the central business district or in areas of Florence zone general business as delineated on the Northampton zoning map. B, mobile food vehicles may park and operate in legal public parking spaces outside of the central business district or in areas not zoned general business in Florence. Mobile food vehicles must not impede traffic, may not park or operate in handicapped spaces commercial loading zones or other restricted parking spaces. Mobile food vehicles must pay applicable parking fees. They're exempt from the time limits on the parking meters, but must pay the meter fees due all enforcement hours. No overnight parking is allowed by mobile food vehicles. C, mobile food vehicles are not permitted to park or operate on sidewalks. D, no permit issued here under shall authorize a mobile food vehicle to operate in a public park on a city-owned parking lot. Five, space availability. Uh, granting a mobile food vehicle permit does not guarantee parking or space availability. Six, hours of operation. Mobile food vehicles may operate between the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, and between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2 a.m. Friday through Saturday. Seven, service of food. Mobile food vehicles may not conduct business with people in vehicles nor shall mobile food vehicles serve customers who stop or park vehicles in a vehicle or bicycle travel lane near the food mobile food vehicle. Business may only be conducted curbside. Mobile food vehicles may not provide seating of any kind, and mobile food vehicles shall not be left unattended. 
Eight, music and amplification. Mobile food vehicles may not play loud music or use any sound of, or kind of sound amplification to attract customers. And that's C ordinance, uh, City Ordinance 245-4. Trash and recycling mobile food vehicles must provide trash and or recycling receptacles. Mobile food vehicle operators must arrange for disposal of their commercial trash and recycling and are prohibited from using public receptacles for that purpose. Ten, concerns and complaints about mobile food vehicle operations. Any violation of this ordinance shall be uh, caused to suspend or revoke a permit issued hereunder. Concerns and complaints received by the city about mobile food vehicle operations will be handled by the appropriate enforcement officers with permit review by the police department as it deems necessary. And enforcement violations of this ordinance may be enforced by the police department through non-criminal disposition procedures set out in Chapter 40-5. I feel better. I don't think I could say mobile food vehicles one more time. I know. So, um, uh, the, um, and then the other two items, of course, as we, we already discussed were essentially the fee. Uh, the, well, because I did that, that the, uh, the, fee, the fee group? schedules and the board. Sent down those as a group. A group. Oh, they've been moved as a group and seconded. Oh, okay. Discussion. Oh, actually, the mayor is here to speak to that and. Councilor Carney, you have a question, sir? No, no, I'll let you go ahead and. If I could just give a quick background. Um, so, uh, uh, given the recent rise in, in popularity of mobile food trucks in the Valley, um, we've gotten a number of questions about what the city's various policies are regarding it. And we have had a series of policies in place, uh, primarily uh, uh, regulations that were promulgated by the Department of Public Works, which has jurisdiction over sidewalks and streets, and and um, and uh, and we have had a history of um, uh, we have uh, mobile food trucks already currently that are and and the licensing uh, list of things that they have to do are, are already things that they have to do now. They're driven by state law, the Board of Health permits, the inspections by the fire department. Those are all things that they have to do. So when you go to the three county fair and you see the food trucks that are there, they all have go through that licensure process. What, where there was some ambiguity, or at least there was not a clear ordinance, was the issue of uh, sort of putting it all in one place. And the city solicitor uh, recommended following several um, incidents with food trucks and trying to understand what the city's policy was that we try to create an ordinance that captured all of it in an ordinance form um, and created a streamlined process so that anyone who wanted to operate one of these trucks would sort of see all in one place these are all the the um, things that they would have to do um, in order to do that so that was the reason for putting the ordinance together in terms of the um, I mean obviously the the, the the main piece of this um, is obviously the location where they can operate. Mm -hmm. And we had an existing uh, DPW regulation for many years about the central business district. Um, and so this attempts to codify what's been the status quo in terms of our policy by putting it into an ordinance form. Um, the general business uh, district in Florence uh, came about through my uh, meetings and conversations with the Florence Civic and Business Association who had concerns comparable to, I think, what drove the regulations uh, downtown, uh, and that namely a food truck parking right out in front of a restaurant mm -hmm. um, in the central business uh, district. And so we were trying to make, we were trying to create at least a, a quality between the Florence business district and the, and the central business district in laying the groundwork for the ordinance. So, I just want to be clear, and you may have seen Amherst has recently adopted this, and I want to um, give credit uh, uh, to Lynn Simmons in my office, who spent a great deal of time researching other mobile food truck ordinances around the state, um, and we actually convened a, a small working group of um, department heads, the various department heads, to get ideas, and we circulated drafts of this to all of our department heads. and and um, to try to come up with, and we had the city solicitor look at it as well, uh, to try to come up with what we felt was appropriate for Northampton. Now, obviously, uh, you know, this is sort of a baseline, and um, 
and if there's, uh, it does allow for future changes, et cetera, but we want it, we felt it was important to get this into an ordinance form um, because the police have had to, in a few occasions, um, enforce the regulations that are in place right now, and this gives them uh, the ability to do that with much more clarity. I, I actually like, I like the whole thing, except for D. Uh, I, first off, proof of comprehensive liability insurance, I think, is a must. But I'm not sold on the workers' comp thing. If you have a, a husband and wife or just a single owner operating a food thing, it, it's not required. It, it is required, isn't it? No. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Sole proprietor. Workers' comp is not required so, for a sole okay. proprietor. Well, it does say um, uh, as determined by the police department. So uh, it's, it, there's discretion in terms of what their what liability and workers' comp. So they're going to be issuing their own, similar to what they've done for taxi cabs, similar to what they've done for petty cabs, similar to ice cream trucks. Um, so uh, we can see clarification on that. Because yeah. maybe you could it, 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 the language is proof of comprehensive liability insurance and workers' compensation insurance with coverage limits, as determined by the police department. So it says you have to have it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you added, if you, actually the way you read it, if you put an or in there, it's just fine. And or proof of comprehensive or. liability and or workers' comp. I mean that, that's fine. Because uh, do I hear somebody amend? Could be it could be yeah, yeah. I, regulatory I, I, prohibitive for I offer an amendment just to yeah. put an or next to the and in uh, section uh, one sub part D. Uh, there's a motion to amend the language. Second. And a second. Uh, discussion. Want to add a click? Um, yeah, I'd like to add where applicable after insurance, the word insurance. The, 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 okay. so the amended language is or and or slash like and, and or where applicable. Where applicable. applicable. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Uh, Councilor Carney? So just a question about um, and this came up in ordinance because we were unclear about how this relates to the construction site mobile food unit, unit you know, the roach coach. Roach coach. So, right, yeah. yeah. That's what we called it in the Air Force. Right. Came around. So, I mean, does this preclude those going then on any no. construction sites downtown? Uh, you know, because it's of, good. I'm thinking of the police station or, you know, anything recent where they may have, I mean, those are typically there to. Ex expedite that yeah. coffee time. I guess I'd have to, I guess those vehicles themselves would be, are already regulated and are, you know, already have to go get all the licensure that's, that we've listed. But I think that um, doesn't this, doesn't this um, say that they are not allowed to operate downtown? In the central business district. So that's what correct. my question is, if there were a construction site, then for example, hmm. like the police station, would they not be able to arrive at that site. Good question. I don't ever recall there being any, uh, uh, particularly with Cereos and State Street so close. Right. Uh, right. I think they served plenty of sandwiches to those folks, which was all, it's good for the economy. Uh, right. But I don't know about the, I don't know about the, I mean, I know Usually we have those, them. That, those folks come in the morning time, not necessarily yeah. at, the, at the lunch oh, hour. It wouldn't apply if they pulled into the lot or yeah, we can, let me, let me, I'd be happy yeah, that, to check. That was just the one question. Yeah, I can check on that. I know we have them that operate in the industrial park that, that yeah. uh, I know that we have them that come to some of the big, uh, larger businesses in the industrial park and circulate around. So uh, I, it would only be if, if they, if they're used to having access and have mm -hmm. been, would this then be something that then pushed them off those sites? And if so, is that something we'd. I guess I'd have to, what I could do is check with our um, Board of Health and find out how many of these operators we have registered now, because they would, re they are required to have the state sanitary permit. Um, so we can, I can try between now and second reading, try to do a little research on that. Um, and if we need to put some accommodating language for that, I just would, um, I'd also want to be careful of equity with other operators right. and, and figure it out. So, 
Yeah. Not Supreme and Daniels. By my, uh, by my reading, I do not think that the um, they would be allowed to operate in in any location in the central business district. Uh, that's what it sounded like mm -hmm. a, when we looked at yeah. ordinance, but you know. And I don't know whether that's a step that we want to take, if, if especially if it's something. Well, technically, right of, now the regulations say, the DPW regulations say they're not supposed to operate in the central business district. So I don't know of any that have been, but I think we're. We I, haven't had many downtown construction no. projects. Exactly. The police station. Yeah. Yeah, and as I said, I I saw most of those folks either at Sirios or or State mm -hmm. Street, so. For the, you know, that's where they were mostly getting their sandwiches. So, Councilor Tate. Yeah, as a rule, they pull right onto the job site. Uh, right, but some, it, I mean, unless there's no act, unless there's something going on, unless yeah. they have to be on the sidewalk. Even if the zone, I mean, if the job site's in the zone, then. <laughs> right. Yeah, but the, the, the Board of Public Works had it because it was sidewalks. It was. Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. But private property? You know, if they pull onto private property. I'm just the way I again the way I read it. 4A mobile f MFVs are not permitted to operate in the central business district. Period. Period. So, That's it. Yeah. I don't know. But it's on any street or any other public property. Um, they need to be licensed and permitted. So um, the ordinance is only discussing uh, you know the ones that are <laughs> operating on, on our city streets and on our. Our side, our public property. <coughs> the only reason I brought it up is because it sounds like that's what the legislation is intended to mm -hmm. address those on the sidewalks and who, but it and may the have the works. consequence of yeah. also ruling out those vehicles that have been allowed in the past. And that's why I'm, that's the only reason I, okay. and if that's what we intended in writing this, and um, if it is, my, then that's. My intent was not, I mean, my intent was addressing someone uh, selling from the public streets in a public parking spot. Right. Uh, and so if this is unintended and mm -hmm. it's an unintended con consequence, whether we want to address that some way in the, okay. uh, in the land. Yeah. Those vehicles, they show up for 15 minutes and are gone. That's what I mean. I mean, yeah. usually, and it's usually not the lunch hour, it's usually at the 930. It's coffee break. Right. And that's it. Um, and they're not called mobile food vehicles no, either. No, called the road. We, we leave it alone. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, we're uh, crafting, this law was originally crafted, and we're crafting this law again, as you pointed out, to essentially protect some enterprises downtown who feel that, Jeff, that, this, that food trucks have, for a variety of reasons, unfair uh, uh, they they don't share the same challenges that restaurants do, um, such as providing seating parking, um, and also by state code they don't they're not quite as strict. And I understand the downtown businesses' concerns, but the fact that I I the thing that makes me a little squeamish is that uh, I've heard I've been told by many downtown businesses that uh, you know essentially an open and free economy promotes all boats rise with the same tide. Um, the beauty of these particular systems is they're incubated systems for people who, uh, many of them, the, the higher end food trucks that we're seeing now are people who aspire to actually have a business, hopefully in Northampton at some point, and generate, you know, but this is a great way to start up with having to invest in that commercial space that might not be available or, or be on their reach right now. Um, relegating them to the periphery, I, it makes me a little squeamish. At the same time, I, I would love to see, personally, I think, um, some type of a, a plaza or something that would be able to accommodate this. Isn't this probably a larger mm -hmm. conversation when we talk about yes. expanding and improving public space? But I would love to see some type of place like that that would actually be appealing for a, a larger draw for pedestrians mm -hmm. with a wider variety of food options. And it doesn't preclude local restaurants from having their own food trucks. Exactly. A lot of local restaurants don't do lunchtime businesses in some cases. They prefer to favor dinner business mm -hmm. uh, just for higher price lines. So it, it always, I, it, my concern is that, that we are too strict. And actually, 
you guys, I, on the initial meetings with the department heads and, and with Lynn and in discussions with Lynn, I, I, I think that you've come up with kind of a reasonable compromise, but I would like to consider that we would expand the options as we start to become more comfortable I, with I'm, I'm open to that way. other conversation. My issue now is just trying to codify what we have exactly. so that it's codified to get, or get rid of the ambiguity. That, the, the, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't come back Right. And create the pods, or you know, there's cities are doing, um, you know, lots of different things. Uh, Boston food trucks have become, you know, incredibly popular. They have quotas. They have fees they charge. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's been a positive thing. But we're talking about a much larger right. business and I, district and a much larger, a much more diffuse business district. Right. And so, the impetus for this was there were some food trucks who were operating here and no one was particularly sure of who to go to, what the rules were, and so on and so forth. And I understand that the, the reason that we had to at least create clear yeah. criteria in which to function and work food trucks in the community so that, that the ambiguities wouldn't create bigger problems. So. Exactly. Yeah, this is just generally what we're doing now. Yeah. Mostly codified. And I do think that there is some space for change mm -hmm. here, but uh, we do want to make sure that the restaurant the restaurant businesses that are downtown um, do not feel as though they're being you know we're trying to undercut them um, because uh, we, we don't want to end up with a bunch of uh, residences downtown you know after the first 20 feet and food trucks driving all around <laughs> <laughs> on the first floor yeah right in the back <laughs> more miles to feed Jesse in the back. Uh, any further discussion um, your request was for two readings on this? Yes. Yeah. Did. Did. Yes. 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 There have been some ish police, some issues, right. enforcement issues that may be dry. I, I didn't realize that they had requested two readings. Yeah, they did. Or, or two readings tonight. So I'm comfortable if it waits until September, whatever date that is, 5th. Yeah. September 5th. September 5th. A couple more weeks. To get a little, yeah, a little bit of feedback can. from this, too. Well, of course, this is the, the, the food truck season, so it's uh, <laughs> Oh, hell. All right, let's uh, let's get to it. Well, this is in the first reading. Uh, all those in favor? Oh, I oh, 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 I'm sorry. It's oh. I'm sorry. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Okay, that's all three. That's the ordinance and the fee so. schedule so. and enforcement so. officer so. application. So. What's that? Can't live in a food truck. No, sir. You've been on the first floor? This is um, from Mayor David J. Narkowitz. This is the appointment, appointment of city residents to serve in an ad hoc roundhouse lot development advisory committee. And, um, did you all have this memo? What yes. number is this? This is, well, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're leaping all over the place. This is where I know. Three on page two. Number three on page two. See it? Under the bullet point is reports of committees, the last item in the category. Playing along at home. For folks who are playing along. Oh, and, and here. Um, you all have the memo. Um, uh, do you want me to read it? No. No. Do you want me to read the names? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's important. Uh, this is, but as I said, this is uh, the mayor is uh, uh, here. asking to appoint a round, uh, an ad hoc roundhouse uh, development advisory committee, and the people that he's advancing are he's recommending um, four residents to serve with Ed Lou, members uh, Councilor Spector, Freeman, Daniels, Schwartz, Casey, as the ad, and. And in addition, Julie Cowan, who's the vice president of TD Bank, and she's a member of the Northampton Economic Development Advisory Committee. Peter Frothingham, uh, who's a registered architect, former member of the Central Business Architecture Committee. Mary Casper, retired executive assistant to Mary Ford and former co-director of the Northampton Arts Council. And 
<coughs> and William Tarum uh, Tarumsha, who's the licensed general contractor and project manager and principal of William J. Tarumsha's design and construction. Second. Second. Mayor, do you want to speak to, the, to, the, to this? Uh, Councilors, do one or either of you have a question? Well, I just wanted to say that um, the mayor came to Edlu committee and asked us about uh, doing this and whether we wanted to go ahead and do that and give him kind of permission to submit these names to us. And my understanding is that would not have to be in referral. It may be, but I thought that from coming to Edlu, I thought that we were kind of giving our blessing to this to then move forward to the to the whole council. And and I would give it my blessing and support this. And my goal is to have us get started in September and, and have the consultant that we um, are working with through that mass development uh, program uh, meet, begin meeting with you at your next meeting in September uh, okay. to start planning some of the public outreach that we want to do. So um, that's why I put, and I think we discussed because of the timing of you not having that's a right. in August that I should put this forward to right. the council. So it would be, and we're modeling this somewhat after the successful Florence Community Center model where we kind of did a hybrid of a council committee with some citizens. And so I've tried to select people that bring different disciplines and live in different parts of the city and, and could help complement uh, the EDLU committee. So, and, uh, and then as you see, we're, we're going to have Util, the company that's doing the uh, pre-development work, come to the next EDLU meeting, which we would do as sort of a kickoff of this ad hoc group to, uh, to begin that work. Okay. So I would just like to encourage counselors to support this, both given the, the time frame of it and that uh, we, we actually went through this, uh, through a process in the EDLU committee. I just move we uh, suspend the referral rule to any to appoint. Yes, yeah. to suspend rule 30. And a motion to suspend rule 30 all those in favor aye. 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 opposed okay uh any other discussion on this no. on these candidates all those in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions thank you okay where the hell are we are you here for anything else mayor or do you want to go home you're welcome to say we have <laughs> We, we are up to secondhand licenses if you're interested. <laughs> Got it. Get your Carolyn, dog. so we can send Carolyn home. Uh, <laughs> Carolyn does. All right, let me ask. The, the Carolyn couldn't can stay and speak to uh, the accepting the land adjacent to King Street with that we approved out of finance and also the Sawmill Hills Conservation Area. Is it the council's pleasure that she be here? Okay, Carolyn. Sorry, you get to stay. Um. Could we do those next? For we want to do those next? Okay. Yeah. Let's do those next. No reason to keep her. All right. Wait. This is like throwing the I Ching here on the agenda. It's just sort of. Uh, this, uh, do you want me to read this again? Uh, nope. Council Murphy read them in finance. Nope. No. no we are. Uh, beautifully, uh, with yeah. a, a lilt. And um, <laughs> do you want to consider them separately or? All right, so we'll start with, uh, this is uh, to accept the easement or fee simple title to uh, strips of land along King Street to accommodate the offered donations and future donations on King Street. <coughs> so moved. Okay. Second it. The motion is made. Uh, Carolyn, you want to step up? In the Am I beeping? Am I beeping? Um, <laughs> So um, in general, the, we've got three property owners as part of permitting have offered to dedicate public easements along the sidewalks on King Street. And so you all have to accept those um, easements when they come in. But it was part of the site plan um, review um, process and, and um, um, offered as, as um, traffic mitigation as well. We've done this before, and we also feel that planning board, that there might be um, there might be donations in the future, so this is sort of an open 
um, allowance for the planning board to continue in that vein where there might be opportunities um, to create um, uh, public access, uh, particularly when um, the right of way varies along King Street and sometimes the sidewalk is in the right public right of way, sometimes it's on private property. And in a couple of these cases, there's just portions of the sidewalk, they straddle the line. So in order for it to be a clean, um, you know, public access, uh, we need an easement for the whole thing. So that's what this is about. Council LaBarge. Right. Um, how big are th these slivers? Well, they vary. So um, could be like, I think like on the VW. Six feet? Yeah. Um, and they could be potentially more in the future, but these ones here go from, I think, maybe one and a half in a section, one and a half feet, um, to six or seven feet. Yeah. Council Murphy. But these are sort of a quid pro quo. You want your permit, we want our sidewalk. I mean, there's. Well, no, there are many ways you could, um, th there are many ways that the, um, projects could move forward. So it's not, this was um, one of the things, uh, the way that um, the zoning is written is the applicant um, in, in, well, let's take um, the VW and Hyundai. Um, there was a discussion about traffic mitigation and what, how they might be able to value what um, was on their property to offset some of that mitigation. So the, the planning board um, basically said we would, you know, instead of pay making a payment in lieu of, we understand there's a value to the easement and the sidewalk, so we want to grant you that value so you can take care of it that way. There are other mechanisms that they could have um, proceeded on. Council LeBarge. So this, the way it sounds like this will give um, the city the option to widen the sidewalks in bicycle lanes right. by doing this, correct? Right. I mean, there are no plans right now, but you know, sort but of there's the a future possibility that, yeah. because you do have three options down there right now. I think on King Street, right? And People's Bank is another one that I think came in either came in previously or will be coming too as part of their construction. It's oh. on the other side of the street. Council Freeman Dent. Thank you. Um, I can't. I'm not really sure <laughs> if I'm for this or, or against this. Uh, because it seems to me that um, uh, there are a couple things that I'm wondering about. Uh, first, I, I very much understand the, the, the need to create complete streets um, and that uh, the visioning process for King Street involved um, in some respects, in some places, especially uh, much wider tree belts than we, than we have in some places. And uh, that to me was one of the only saving elements to that visioning. So uh, that's something we have to do. But I think it's, it seems a little too open-ended for me because our, the way I understand and the way that uh, your office has typically presented uh, a traffic mitigation is that the first uh, the, the first desired um, uh, element of traffic mitigation is actual infrastructure improvements or changes by the by the developer. The second is the second. Uh, if if you can't get that, then the second that the planning board usually says is that uh, they can they'll accept um, money, and those that money uh, goes into a designated account and can be sometimes pooled with other monies that of around similar areas and it, it can actually build up and be made be used for something that uh, the, the neighborhood or the, the uh, businesses can really uh, can really use um, we have different traffic mitigation pots of money all over the city and, and it, it use them uh, I think judiciously and, and uh, well but it seems now that there's a third option which is that uh, a, de a, a property owner or developer can just cut off a little strip of their land and give it to the city and say, see, now we're satisfying the traffic mitigation requirements. So I'm a little worried that, um, that this is too, that this is um, actually letting some of these uh, property owners uh, get away with uh, overvaluing little strips of um, land that they don't value very much at all, but uh, for some reason we might be uh, overvaluing. Um, so I'm, I'm a little nervous about this uh, this being uh, a, becoming a practice on along King Street. 
Do you want to address that? Yeah, I'm going to address <laughs> It's a follow-up to that just to ask you, maybe this is what you're going to say. Does the property owner get the decision about what the mitigation is? Because that's implying that the property owner yeah. has three choices now and I can decide A, B, or C. And I thought the planning board is the one who says, wait a minute, this is what we want you to do. And so what this just allows is another option for the planning board to make that decision. It doesn't let the property owner off. Well, and uh, that's correct. And we don't have specific, I mean, each property is different, has a different scenario. Um, and in some cases, it's not always about traffic mitigation. In some cases, um, it, it's, it's not. I mean, we look at the, the, um, the LIA, Kia dealership. They rebuilt their sidewalk, and because we now have a bigger buffer requirement between the sidewalk and the street, um, that necessarily pushed the sidewalk further in to the property. So then a strip of the sidewalk is actually straddling the property line. So in order to have a public sidewalk, you want to make sure that there's a public access easement on, along the entire thing. So part of it is it's not always about traffic mitigation. It just happens that in, in a couple of these instances, there was um, um, part, of the part of the traffic mitigation was um, made up by this um, but, easement, but it's not the in, it's not the entire thing. And I would say that there is a tremendous value to getting more land on King Street to reserve for future potential projects that would allow the city to go at a time that we can get grants to do an entire corridor worth of changes if we have that land ready to go. I just so. I just want to be clear. Yeah. It's getting late, maybe, but I think the fear that the councilor is addressing is the fear that. And I just want to make sure I ask this again, I get a clear answer. So, that the property owner then will have be able to decide, oh, we're going to do this and think it's valuable enough that we either won't give money, right. which we use for other things, or won't do other things. And that's not their decision. It merely gives the planning board. So, right. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. yes. Okay. Just that's what it is. Any other discussion? Councilor Premier? That, that is helpful. Thank you, Councilor, uh, for clarity. I, I just. Um, I do want to make sure that the that this is used judiciously and uh, there's nothing yeah. here that says it that it will be but um, but uh, that's that's my, uh, my hope. Yeah. obviously this order can be rescinded by the council at any future date any other All roll call. Adams? yes Adams? yes yes Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. This is um, this is the sawmills uh, conservation area. Um, uh, accept a motion. Put it on the floor. Move to approve. Second. Right. Alan, you want to speak to this, or do you have a question to start off with? Yeah, I just have one question. Who is going to receive? The conservation restrict. Who's going to hold the conservation restriction for this land? Uh, a conservation commission. They will hold it. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. The King Street. Is that what you're talking about? No, 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 no sawmills. No. Sawmills. Yeah. Sawmills. Sawmill. 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 Because it says it says in there. So I thought, well, maybe you were talking about. I'm sorry. No, no. You don't have those for sidewalks. Yep, CR <laughs> So <laughs> it will be Conscom that holds this, the conservation restriction. No, it's a purchase. Land. But who, but it does say here the city council accepts such conservation restrictions at the at the way and it says that and the conservation commission is authorized right. to grant conservation restrictions. Who who is which what body is going to hold that conservation? The commission. The commission, the commission will hold it and mm -hmm. the city will own the land. Yes. Right. Just like Turkey Hill Road. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Roll call. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> Stop it again sometime. <laughs> okay. I, I hope no one's sitting here for a license. <laughs> She's. <laughs> We're up to licenses. We're back to page two. On top of page two, the second hand licenses. This is um, for 
B. Can we take these as a group? You want to take yes, them as a take group? Yes, take them as a group. There's a motion for, take them as a group for Noel V, uh, Kids Closet, and Market Street Antiques. Move Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. All right. Hey. Um, I'm going to ask now that the council take their vote to extend the council meeting, and I would uh, ask someone to put that on the floor. I'll put that on the floor, so move. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor of extending the meeting beyond 11 o'clock, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you all. I appreciate that. Being <laughs> We're being adults. Uh, this is the approval of minutes for uh, for a sunset provision. Uh, that no sunset. Seven to four. Uh, we we, did, we sunset done and gone, dude. Sunrise. <laughs> sunrise. Yes. We'll be done before sunrise. Uh, this is approval of minutes. So moved. Oh, second. Any discussion? Okay. July 11th. For July 11th. July 11th. Yep. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Uh, then reports of the uh, committees on uh, social service and veterans affairs minutes, and also the committees on rules, ordinances, and ordinance Move minutes. To approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. Let's see. We've done the financial orders. Close. This is upon the uh, recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, this is an order that where the uh, Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability. Um, you want to know where you are in the where we are in the National Order Five. Correct. Second read. Wait. Where are we here? A wave reading on second reading. We're doing. The second Community reading. Preservation second. I'll move. The second move. waving reading on. Second. No, no, I, I know we on the second. Well, we have the second reading. <laughs> yeah. Five and second reading. Oh, got it. All right. The Greenway. <laughs> this, yeah, this is the seventy-seven thousand dollars to be appropriated from the CPA funding of the Connecticut River Greenway project. And second reading. So moved. Second. In discussion. Roll call. Roll call. Let's call for roll. Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. No. I think we're on eight. Storm eight. Eight. This is number eight. Yep. Item eight. Which one did we just do? We just did. Yeah. Move acceptance of the report. This is this is for the stormwater. <laughs> Ad hoc advisory task force report, and this is second reading oh, from minority yeah. reconsideration. Uh, it's, it's been moved and seconded. I'll uh, second it. Councillor uh, Casey moved it, and Councillor Murphy seconded, I believe. Sounds good. Sound right? Uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I um, I sent around a, uh, a proposed amendment today to the councillors. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think if, if we don't have a paper copy for everyone, I, I, can, I can be prepared to read it. Mary's got a copy for everybody. Mary will Let's all take a take a few deep breaths while Mary passes it out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you all have it before you want to walk us through this then? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, the idea we'll hear, as I, as I mentioned last time, was to um, give the Board of Public Works a little more direction when it comes to the Council's, um, the council's uh, pleasure regarding the um, report. And uh, I outlined um, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, six uh, desiderata regarding uh, regarding uh, our our direction to them. But um, I uh, I've now the, the second to last one I I'd like to uh, rescind as part of this amendment because it it, uh, 
it really is something the board should should probably leave to us counselors and we can ask them for some technical we can ask the dpw for technical direction but I so think that's the bpw considers exemptions yes, properties yes. like municipal buildings and streets and for properties that receive no flood protection and the bpw recommends against such exemptions to present the impacts of such exemptions yeah i think i i think that's mostly a political decision and we should we should not expect the board to take a position so i'd like to just basically i'd like to make the amendment and i'd like to strike strike this part of it but basically to amend uh this uh amend the amendment yes this order and i will second the amended amendment <laughs> all right actually it is just the amendment we haven't even put it on the floor right yet, it's not so. really on the floor so. right so um right well I, I thought we did put this on the floor we put oh, no, the we, until until it's we, we didn't just because it's written up doesn't mean that it's fully you know. oh i see the amendment's the amendment. not a put on the floor i believe okay you offer the amendment and you just second it so now it's on the floor. I'm offering the amendments minus yeah. that last little yeah. bit but that's okay the so can i speak to the amendment all right so you may yes okay so um i want to thank the counselor even though i was hesitant to do this at the last session um i think you clarified very well those issues that the task force basically if you read the report he pulled out and he outlined these are the things that the majority of the task force supported so rather than giving options on these the counselor has basically identified them and say look instead of just giving them both things let's actually support the report and what the majority put in the report for example the hydraulic acreage model was the one that the majority the vast majority of that committee supported so and I, I agree that and I spoke to a number of people on the task force. I spoke to Terry Colhane from the BPW, um, and they're all, they all support this. This is fine with them. And, and, and it's just clarifying, and not, not only clarifying, it's just basically reiterating what the majority of that task force says in the report. Is that, is that a fair estimate of what you're doing? Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the support of my uh, learned <laughs> from work too. Um, the uh, you know the the report was open-ended a little bit on the on the model used and also uh, upon finally reading it I admit that I hadn't read it last time um, you know I there are some elements that uh, that distinguish the two models and one of them is the runoff coefficient so I, I yep. wanted to see uh, what the uh, I wanted the reasoning behind that coefficient to be made more explicit on in in the language that the board uses um, and then pretty much everything else is is just asking the board to come up with credits and incentives and any and to make explicit any reasoning regarding caps minimums credits incentives, and so on which i'm confident they're going to do anyway um, but this is uh, i think a more public process than we would have had last last month oh, sorry. I, I just want to say thank you to the, to the learned to the learning counselor from Ward Three. My um, my, this is a, a step up from from my order that I drafted. Mine was basically asking them to, to draft a, um, an ordinance, but this they were looking for direction, so this gives them much more specific and clear direction as to as to what we really want. So thank you. So are we all kumbaya here. We're gonna want to vote for this. Yep. Yep. All right. Want to roll call on this? To the amendment. To the amendment, this is to the voting amendment. on the amendment. You don't need a roll call for that. Oh, okay. oh, now, I'm just asking to see if anyone's keen on one. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The amendment passes. And now to the final report. It's an order. Uh, the order. Uh, it's already on the floor, I believe. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. That will be referred to the Board of Public Works, who's already hard at work at this. So, uh, <laughs> so um, yes, that's actually technically the third reading. Um, send it up for breakfast. We're up to uh, number number, number nine. nine. Number nine. So number nine. It's a Beatles reference. Anyone who said I, I, I got it. All is dead. We got it over okay. here. Okay. Us learn it in older. <laughs> got it. This is uh, this is to amend Belmont Avenue parking prohibition at all times. Um, so moved. Except, there's a motion. Is there a second? Is that a second? Second. 
<clears throat> Any discussion on this? Council Freeman Daniel. This is for Belmont. Yeah. This is for Belmont. Belmont Ave. This is just a, um, we're trying to clear up a parking. We're not eliminating a parking space. We're just moving a, a sign, basically. All we have to do is we actually have to change the sign in the ordinance. So we're moving a sign. We're moving a sign. Okay. We hold great powers in our hands. So please vote wisely. All those in favor? Aye. I'm sorry, Aye. ordinance. Aye. Roll call. Yes. Aye. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Now, poor, middle poor, street. poor Middle Street and poor Councilor Murphy. This is the uh, <laughs> Middle Street <laughs> parking, and the request is now to table this indefinitely. First, we have to put it on the floor, right? Yes. Okay. So, so moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. It's moved and seconded. Now, the request moved is to table it indefinitely. Second. Second. Okay. No debate. All those in favor of tabling, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. But wait, it's back. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> How do you feel now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, look. It's, it's Middle Street. It will be parking on us soon. Um, this is the temporary, temporary rule. Uh, for pavement marking on Middle Street, Florence. Uh, so moved. Second it. This we discussed this at length uh, the last time. This is to <laughs> mark the parking spaces and designate them on Middle Street. Please make the learned counselor to work to explain this because I don't think I completely understand it. <laughs> oh, right, what are you? What? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh. <laughs> You know, actually, now learned starting to sound like an insult. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, <Move your steam. laughs> yes. Uh, Council Freeman Dane. Thank you. Uh, this um, this is becoming a uh, a fun a fun order for the council. <laughs> we first tried it. Uh, the history, brief history. I believe we first tried it when we when we tried it. I don't really remember this, but everyone says it was a disaster. I would like to try it again, the reverse parking on Main Street. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's uh, not, not where we are. But that we created, the council created an ordinance that allows for orders from the council uh, regarding temporary, um, really tr temporary traffic uh, tests. Um, so we're stretching it a little bit to call this a traffic test, but really many ways it's a parking test but uh, we we're um, we've trying to answer the concerns about parked vehicles overhanging driveways and 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 um, we we've asked we're basically we're asking the Department of Public Works to paint lines that extend onto the street and um, it's really important that uh, this is not precedent setting this is uh, this is a hybrid solution, which may not be a solution, but it's a hybrid solution, or it's a hybrid. It's an attempt. It's an experiment to see if this works for this street and these circumstances. Um, it's not that uh, the DPW and the city, I do not believe, are going to be committing to painting lines on, on every street that happens to have some parking on it. This is similar to the experiment that's about to manifest on. Prospect Street, the four-way yes. stop. That, uh, yes, yes, that's right. We passed that earlier this, this term. Yeah. But the uh, last piece is that um, the the test shall not last longer than 120 days. What really the way we read that is that enforcement of the lines won't last. We're not going to expect the DPW to come grind the lines off after 120 days. They'll eventually recede, um, but gotcha. uh, we do expect the public will continue to respect the lines even after. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, this all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Roll call. It's an order. It's an order. It's just an order. Who's asking a roll call? Would uh, you like a roll call, Council? You yeah. want a roll? Yes. Let's roll call. <laughs> okay. All right. Might as well. Might as well. Aye. You're all right. Council Labarge, do you want to vote yes or no? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 
Let's pass some first reading. You want to? Right. I'm going to move to suspend rule. Second, the two reading rule. Second. Thank you. There's a motion to suspend rules. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Let's got some motion. To motion to uh, second reading. Second. Uh, seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No roll call on that one? Okay. Perfect. All right. Up to council rules. This is we're in, uh, in Councilor Adams' bailiwick here. Take, this, uh, take them as a group? I move, I move take 12. No. Uh, actually, no. you want to do each one? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the other one's in. Yeah. Okay. One wants Same. two readings and. Um, one's table. Well, I, don't, I don't seem to have 43 in, that I can find. So. Yeah, it's, um, it's the executive session. Here, I have an extra copy. Thank you. I mean, we can take them both as a group, I guess. I, I just, there's one that's really correcting of it. We'll do one, we'll do one, we'll bang them up. Just a brief explanation of Rule 43. Actually, let's put it on the floor first. Move 43. Second. Second. All right, there you go. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is just based on a, on a conversation I had with the council president about just coming up with a with a process to um, release executive session minutes that have been approved in executive session. So really it's just item number four is what I added. It's just, just to clarify that and create that process and codify them in the rules. Okay. That's you it. I understand. Uh, yep. We, we were, yeah, we were we, stuck yeah. in an infinite loop. Yes, right, right. Going into executive session to vote out the last minutes from the last one. And rather than condemn ourselves to that, Councilor Adams has been kind enough to draft a rule that <laughs> allows us an escape clause. Right. Uh, any other discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> uh, this is rule changing. Uh, this is rule number two, and the request is for two readings on this one. Um, Move first reading. Second. And Councilor Adams, you want to speak to this? Yeah, when I first drafted this rule, I basically cited the it's state law on this, but our charter has its own provision. So, whereas the Massachusetts state law, that's actually, I quoted the case in the, in the old rule, um, where it basically says that uh, a majority of a quorum could pass a measure. That would only be three votes in some circumstances. Our charter says that you actually need five. So, that will, that needs to be changed to be in accordance with our charter. Okay. Yep. I, I think this is actually a huge step up from the previous rule because it, it actually has each kind of vote or a lot mm -hmm. of the kinds of votes that we do kind of listed out mm -hmm. in, um, you know, six, six, five, then, then just a simple majority. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be very useful. Um, actually, since we're here, um, if we could do based on what the mayor said earlier that it, it requires six members to adopt an appropriation or transfer perhaps we can just adopt that in right now um so if i could just amend to have a second sentence read the affirmative vote taken by roll call of six members shall be required to adopt an appropriation order or transfer second second okay so the amendment is to change the language adding mm -hmm. and transfer all those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Just to speak okay. to it? Yeah. If, if it turns out that the mayor wasn't correct about that, this would, that in the state law allows it, we, we could super, that would supersede the rules anyway. So there's no right. real harm to yeah. adopt it. But if we find out that's the case, I'll, I'll change it just to clarify. But that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to the amendment, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, now to the order? Yep. <coughs> uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, they wanna Jesse, didn't you want two readings on that? Yes, suspend please. rule 14. Second. All right, there's a motion by Council LaBarge to, to suspend the rules, and Councilor Specter is seconded. <coughs> uh, all, uh, all those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Second reading. Opposed? Okay, there's a motion to move. Second. Second. Reading. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
opposed? All right. Thank you. <coughs> um, there's, this is to adopt council committees, and there's been a request. Can um, we do the next two as a group? Yeah, take the two together. 14 yeah. and 15. Sure. Going to the same place. Sure, sure, sure. Um, these, these are what? To table them? Yeah. This is a request to table to December 5th. Okay. Um, yeah, but, but first of all, we have yeah. to put them on the, okay. on the floor yeah. here. Yeah. So, so I, move, I would move them as a group. And then move second. Them as a group, there's a second. Is there any discussion of this first before the motion for table? You want to explain why? That's what I don't have to explain. Explain. The reason why is because um, we don't. I don't think we want these to take effect until next term. So if we put them that way, we don't have nobody loses a committee seat. There's no. There's no real. There's no radical change for right now. If we put them on in December, then we can make any changes and pass them along for the next council. But the concern was that we'd have to reshuffle all the committees and. How that, how well we adapt to change. So, council president does that, right? <laughs> yeah, and you don't know what I went through just to assign you the committees that you have now. So call the question. Oh, sorry. It's like just, you it's know, like doing the twice advice. in a term. It's like doing a table at a wedding. <laughs> yes, uh, I think um, I, I think um, what I look when I look through the packet, I see that I made a I proposed this um, in a new committee and. It, I remember proposing it at ordinance, but I don't think it ever went through into ordinance and it, and it didn't get forwarded up here. Um, but I see it that uh, the counselor has it part of his executive summary. So I, between now and December, I, I better come forward with it. Yeah, don't forget amendment. about that to add yeah. that amendment, yeah. but okay. And just, yeah, this went through the last ordinance, actually. Yeah, we, we discussed it. The, one, um, the hearings, hearings and investigations. And practices. Yeah. And also, just for the counselors, I, I draft an executive summary on this uh, for your consideration at, at a later point. Okay. All right, is there a motion to table? Move to yeah. table until Second. December 5th. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. This Round Hill Road, Councilor Specter, in the room for two readings. So moved on the Round Hill Road okay. change. <laughs> This is uh, this is of course a uh, prohibited parking prohibition. Second, uh, second, second. You want to speak? To yeah, it again? was it, it was a um, mistaken measurement that was uh, made that it should not have gone. The no parking should not have gone quite as far as we all thought it went one way. It was measured previously by the former city engineer. And it turns out it went too far. Um, I don't have the exact measurements in front of me, but it. This one that's crossed off you at 1,558 yeah. feet before. Now it's amended to 1,000. And uh, the reason I'm asking for two readings this evening is because they're putting up the signage now. The work is going on there. It's been going on for a while. They're putting up the signs, so we'd like to get them in. So if you can do yep. If you pass on the first reading, I hope you'll pass it on the second. All right, so the motion's been made, uh, explained, any other discussion? Uh, this is a roll call. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Uh, suspend rule 14. Second. Uh, motion to suspend rules. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All except the motion for the second. So moved. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Yes. You want to take the next two? Together. Group? Yes. Yes, take them together. All right. This is uh, the off street parking area on, Gar on Gothic Street and then meter locations and regulations on Gothic Street. Sorry, can we separate these out? You want to separate Sorry. them out? Okay. So the first one, number 17. This is off street parking areas on Gothic Street. Um, this is the lower level Gothic Street parking structure, and then the location is the westerly side of Gothic Street adjacent to the police station. Uh, 56 spaces, and uh, the time and limit is class 5C, 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
Monday through Friday, 24 hours, Saturday and Sunday. Move to approve. Second. Motion and seconded. And someone want to speak to this? Uh, Council Freeman Daniels? Uh, yeah, this was this came out of transportation parking as uh, recommended and put to, pulled together by the Central Services Department. Um, basically, we're treating the parking garage very similar to the parking garage that we, the air garage. Um, whenever you park in the garage, you pay. Uh, it's covered parking. It's uh, more valuable than on-street parking. Um, and uh, the only difference really is that the first hour isn't free. So it's a little pricier. By, by, by 75 cents, yes. That's pricier. I, I, I'm just qualifying it. <laughs> yes. um, lastly, you know, we're aware of the restrictions that are, um, that are in place regarding the, the, the um, facility, the uh, parking structure. Um, they were read into the record at the, <laughs> at the Transportation Parking Commission. Um, so really this only applies to post five o'clock, um, post five o'clock uh, on the weekdays and all day, Saturday and Sunday. Any further discussion? We did hear public. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, is, is this for the first one? This is for 17. Yeah, all it does is establish a class. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't do, it doesn't establish a fee. I'm sorry. That's right. right. It's just established as a class. Class of limitation the related to department. 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. Right. right, which bear in mind that pretty much it echoes, it goes, it's in line with, excuse me, it's a little late, it's in line with the um, restrictions of the covenants that uh, the uh, state judiciary requires for this, uh, for this uh, structure. The, the state ceded their parking lot provided they had parking during court hours, court business hours. <clears throat> and l let me just add, um, if the council didn't know this, that the, uh, that, um, the original deal that the uh, judiciary wanted was that uh, it would be parking for all members of the court at any time and any member of their family or friends or any of their assigns at any time. Really? So the police chief managed to uh, um, negotiate, bargain basically with the with the judiciary uh, to uh, allow for parking on out, on off hours, and was successful. Hmm. That's interesting, because that wasn't a pre-existing condition that even when the county owned it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other discussion? All those in favor of this classification, please say aye. Uh, or, I know this ordinance classification is a roll call. Sorry. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. 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 Suspend uh, rule 14, isn't it? Two yes. Rules. Yes. There's a motion. Second. Rules and a second. All those in favor of suspend. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I'll accept the motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Council Carney? Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Now to Change. the parking meter location through regulations. This is uh, essentially the time limit 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, <clears throat> Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, unlimited. 75 cents per hour is the fee. That's with class five fees. Move approval. Second. Second. And you already discussed Previous it. comments. Mm -hmm. Previous comments, Councillor Adams? Um, I, I've changed my mind since ordinance. I think that this should be free during these hours. Um, I understand that it's covered parking, but before this parking garage were there, that this, those hours were free and open to the public. Um, and so I still think they should be. So I oppose this. Thank you. Any other discussion on this? Uh, Councilor Tacey. I absolutely agree with my colleague, my esteemed colleague. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other discussion? Councilor Freeman Day. Yeah, uh, we're having a discussion in the in the commission now, and uh, we're, it will probably be coming through the council maybe in the future. Uh, I, I certainly won't be around for it. 
to uh, redo the technical, some of the technical um, elements regarding uh, billing, basically, for, for parking. Uh, it's going to happen, I think, in the Garrett garage and probably be mimicked in, the, in this one, uh, provided this passes. Um, it's, uh, it will be related to, you know, changing the card system around or, or upgrading it. It's very difficult. Even though the card system, I, I'm a big proponent of it, it's very, it's very effective. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have these long lines and so on and so forth. It's also v very difficult to get service for it. Um, so I expect that if this passes, that uh, the, the, this will look, by the way, the, the, this kiosk will look like the ones on Main Street. So you'll have to, pre it's prepay. Mm -hmm. It won't be like the Gare Garage where it's you, pr you post pay. So there'll be a little bit of a disconnect between, an, of an, of an, uh, a disanalogy rather. But um, I, I expect that in the future we'll have a unified uh, technological system. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Nope. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Nay. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Um, yes. Councilor Aye. Yes. Yes. Council Ford? Yes. Council Stockton? Aye. Council Tate? Uh, um, Council suspend Rule 14. There's been a motion to suspend rules. All Second. Those. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, except, no, I'll accept the motion to put it on the floor. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Yes. Roll call, please. Council Carney? Yes. Yes. Hi. Yes. 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 No. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> now we get to limited time parking on bridge. I'd like to move 19 through 21 as a group. Yeah. Got it. Second. As a group. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. These are uh, limited time parking on Bridge Street, bus stops on Bridge Street, and bus stops on Main Street. Uh, this is um, coming from the Public Work Department of Public Works, but it's already been through transportation and parking and through ordinance, so we can vote on it tonight, and we should. Uh, it relates to the new buses that are so popular that they're getting bigger. Uh, in fact, they're articulated now. They've got a they've got a bend in the middle, uh, like a twisty straw, and uh, they don't fit on the into the normal bus the bus stops we have without changing the parking a little bit and relocating the bus stop uh, in one locate in one particular case. These are the buses that um, they go from roughly from <laughs> Smith to the mall to Ant to UMass to Amherst and back. Um, I rode them as a college student myself. They're very popular. Uh, so we need to, we need basically these changes. Um, Director Huntley went out himself and dealt with the PVTA uh, at each location, and um, these are the s changes he suggested, and it's been endorsed at the TPC. Thank you. We especially need it on the weekends. Any further discussion? <coughs> yes. Hi. Yes. 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 Tacey? Yes. Adams? Yes. Carney? Yes. So. Suspend rule 14. Second. Motion's been made to suspend rules. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, I'll accept a motion for on the floor. Second. Second. Another roll call. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. 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 Carney? Yes. Yes. A couple of referrals here. Uh, one more. Uh, 25. 25. Oh, I'm sorry. The school zone. I, 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 this is uh, also a request for two reasons. This is establishment of school zones by ordinance enumeration. Uh, so moved. Second. 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 Okay. Any discussion on this? So, uh, this is this is a JFK Middle School. The school zone on Bridge Road shall extend from a point of 45 east, 45 feet east of the center line of Juniper Street, located at the intersection with Bridge Road, to a point 35 feet east of the center line of Oak Street, located at the intersection with Bridge Road. And when you expand a school zone, you limit during school hours speed limits. I believe down to 20 miles an hour. 
Right, that's, um, it's actually not even during all of the school hours, it's just during selected hours. Um, but uh, we don't actually have a uh, school zone at JFK. The state laws have changed that allow us, that allow us now to, to install school zones up to eighth grade, so that we are now taking advantage of that. And um, we're, we're, uh, we also hope that this provides some measure of traffic calming because Bridge Road is um, a, can be a very dangerous road for people who, who live on it and walk on it. And, and I presume that what accompanies this is appropriate signage with uh, flashing lights. That, the that, is, that is an assumption that uh, may, Otherwise it's a may speed not track. be funded. Um, <laughs> So we're uh, we're on. We do not have this. This order does not. Uh, or this ordinance rather does not. Uh, is not accompanied by uh, transfer or a uh, appropriation for the department to install a blinking light. Um, the state, of course, is very much behind us creating this school zone, but they're not. They're not as behind us if, if it means we're going to be coming to them and asking them for a blinking light. So we're still working on that. Um. All right. That would impact enforcement, I would imagine, if you can't post it. We are working on that blinking light. All right. All right. You meant blinking as a blinking light as opposed to substituting a swear. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're working blinking on that light. blinking light. We're kind of both. <laughs> kind of both. All right. Uh, this blinking. is uh, blinking light. Roll call, please. Council Labar? Yes. Council yes. Council yeah. Thank you. Yes. 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 Aye. Except the motion to suspend rules. Suspend rule 14. Second. Second. Those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Accept a motion. Move to approve. Second it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any further discussion? No. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. All right. The next two. Can we move to refer as a group? <laughs> no. 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 Freeman Daniels does uh -oh. not want. Can, can we refer 26 to ordinance and the Arts Council? The motion's been made to refer uh, the permit required for structures on streets and sidewalks and public art to be referred sure. to uh, ordinance and now. Yes. The Arts that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Number 27. This is Northampton Center for the Arts Board of Directors. Uh, to refer to ordinance. Move to. Move to refer. Second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now, I have to announce a couple of poll hearings. So, Do we so. have to be here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. The, the, yeah, just take your words. We're not doing that, my God. <laughs> All right, this is uh, at 7, 10 p.m. on September 5th. There will be, uh, this one's 7 o'clock, got it, okay. Oh, this is the second one, okay. This is the, Public hearing on Thursday, September 5th, 2013, at 7.05 for the installation of underground facilities. The uh, National Grid Petition 14632933 on Masonic Street here in Northampton. And then also 7.10 p.m. at uh, September 5th is a poll petition for um, poll petition number, uh, grid petition on 15461208. But a boom, but a bing. All right. Any new business? Um, and we don't need to announce executive session. Thank God. We do? Oh, to vote up the minutes. That's correct. Yeah, well, Sorry. Thank you very much. Rolling. All right. Uh, this is, we are uh, in accordance with Section 26C. 
Uh, uh, chapters uh, two oh, and four of the Charter and the Mass General Law, Chapter uh, 39 for the Supreme Court. Approval and release executive session minutes of January 3rd, 2013 and July 11th, 2013. Not, and we will not reconvene in open session. So we are going to executive session. I'll ask NCTV to shut off the cameras. And when we come out, we will vote. Do we need to adjourn out of regular session first? We could adjourn. Yes. Session tonight. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.